Good morning. My name is Emily Kosky and I'm the chair of the Budget Committee. I'm going to call to order our regular committee meeting for Thursday, December 1st. At this time, I'll ask the city clerk to call the roll to verify the presence of a quorum. Councilmember Payne is absent. Wamsley. Aye. I'm Rainville. sorry, President. <laughs> Rainville is absent. Vita is absent. Ellison. Here. Osman. Here. Goodman is absent. <clears throat> President Jenkins is absent. Chavez. Present. Chugtai. Present. Johnson. Present. Vice President Palmasano. Present. Chair Kosky. Present. Council Member Rainville. Present. There are nine members present. Let the record reflect that we have a quorum. Our budget committee meeting today and tomorrow are our markup meetings during which we will consider amendments to the mayor's 2023 recommended budget. At this point in the budget committee's process, we've received the mayor's 2023 recommended budget, a budget overview and department presentations and held public hearings number one and number two. And after we've considered all amendments to the mayor's 2023 recommended budget, we will send a recommendation to the city council and then at an adjourned city council meeting on December 6th at 6.05 p.m., we will hold public hearing number three, the truth in taxation hearing, and we will vote on our recommendation. Council members have been given an amendment packet, which includes the amendments submitted by council members, as well as legislative directives, which have been written by council members in consideration of the mayor's 2023 recommended budget. As we work through the amendment packet, we will consider all items one by one and in order. With each item, I will recognize the author and ask them to introduce the motion, after which I will ask for a second to the motion. And if there is a second to the motion, I will open the floor for discussion. And after this discussion, I will call for a vote. I'll note that we have city staff on hand to address questions that may arise during our discussions, including our budget office, city attorney's office, and department directors for all departments whose budgets are being considered for changes. As a public works and infrastructure committee, convenes at 1.30. I plan to adjourn this markup meeting between 12.30 and 1 and reconvene at our markup meeting tomorrow to complete our work. I just want to make sure that we thank and I thank all of my council members and colleagues for submitting amendments and change items in a timely manner. Also, I'd like to thank my office for all their hard work, the budget director, Amelia Kruver, also their, the, her team, and the city clerk for working on and working with our council members on all of these amendments and change items to get them in order and preparing us for this markup meeting. Now, do we have any council members who have any questions about the process I just outlined? Council member Goodman. Thank you, Madam Chair. And maybe this is only me, but I am concerned about the fact that there are some unavoidable conflicts for council members tomorrow and that potentially could change the outcome of some of these amendments. So I'd like us to maybe not discuss, but think about how we could move forward in an expeditious manner today without a massive amount of debate so that we can get all of the amendments done today um, because I am concerned that there will be um, a different outcome if a couple people aren't here and then those amendments will want to be brought up on Tuesday night, which as the chair has said, she's not anxious to be here till midnight. I don't think my puppy wants that either. So um, I don't know how other people feel about it. I have had the opportunity to kind of trial balloon this with a couple folks and they thought it was a good idea. I would just urge us, I'm not saying don't talk about things, but there isn't really a reason to debate much of this. A lot of people have been super conscious of talking to other council members about their amendments in advance. Thank you, any other discussion? Thank you, I appreciate the, the comments. And yes, we do have a few council members that are unfortunately not gonna be with us tomorrow for personal reasons and um, wanna make sure we are able to have thorough discussions, but also keep this, keep this in mind uh, today as we continue to, to move forward. So uh, let's dive in to the amendment packet. Uh, so the first amendment is the mayor's technical amendment. It is a series of accounting and technical adjustments and program and capital operations budget corrections. I'll ask, uh, is there a second to the motion? Second. Is there any discussion? I am not seeing any discussion to the mayor's technical amendment before us. I'll ask the clerk to call the roll. Council member Payne. Is absent. Wamsley. Aye. Rainville. Aye. Vita. Aye. 
Ellison. <coughs> Aye. Osmond. Aye. Goodman. Aye. President Jenkins. Is absent. Chavez. Aye. Chugtai. Aye. Johnson. Aye. Vice President Palmasano. Aye. Chair Kosky. Aye. There are 11 ayes. That motion carries. All right, our next amendment is the Mayor's Government Structure Amendment from the Council President, Council Vice Pre President, and I. Uh, Council Vice President, please introduce the amendment. Thank you, Madam Chair. Colleagues, this Government Structure Amendment before you aligns our budget with a number of changes that we as a body made to the Government Structure Ordinance earlier this year and right sizes a number of departments that were either created or expanded as a result of the new Government Structure Ordinance. Um, just briefly, it moves the positions originally in the Office of Performance and Innovation back into PMI from audit, as well as the Chief Resilience position. It moves two full-time positions into the Office of City Auditor for research and policy work. It makes whole the recently created Arts and Cultural Affairs Department. It fills out the Office of Community Safety with two full-time positions, and it creates the third and final Deputy Director of Public Service role. This amendment, yet again, is the result of many hours of work by first volunteers, then city staff, and then our council to set up a new form of government for early success. So while we're not done with the necessary changes to ensure long-term success, these are early additions to begin supporting the legislative efforts of the council and other various departments is a good first step. So I wanna thank Council President Jenkins, Council Member Kosky, and the mayor for their efforts to build this out, and I'll move this forward. Thank you, Council Vice President. I will second the motion. The mayor's government structure amendment has been moved and seconded. Are there any questions from my council members? I am not seeing any uh, uh, any questions? Uh, so we have the mayor's uh, government structure amendment offered by the council president, council vice president, Lene Palmasano, and I before us. I'll ask the clerk to call the roll. Council member Payne. Aye. Wansley. Aye. Rainville. Aye. Vita. Aye. Ellison. Aye. Osman. Aye. Goodman. Aye. Chavez. Aye. Chugtai. Aye. Johnson. Aye. Vice President Palmasano. Aye. Chair Kosky. Aye. There are 12 ayes. That motion carries. Our next amendment is from Council Member Wansley, uh, the Council Vice President, Council Member Ellison, and I. Council Vice President, please introduce the amendment. Thank you, Madam Chair. Colleagues, as you know, we're currently working on restructuring all of our appointed boards and commissions, including our Police Conduct Oversight Commission. Um, under the leadership of Council President Jenkins, we're considering an ordinance to finalize a new community commission on police oversight that would replace the PCOC. While engaging with staff, residents, and former PCOC commissioners, we received feedback that helped to shape the budget amendment before you today that we believe will set this body up for greater success moving forward. So to speak on the specifics of that and the impacts, I will turn it over to my co-author, Councilmember Wansley. Thank you, uh, Council Vice President uh, Pomisano. Um, you know, everyone agrees we do need a civilian oversight commission. Um, everyone agrees that it needs to be fully funded. Um, but I do want to note there is current disagreement on whether or not um, the current ordinance language is the best version of that. Um, and I am very hopeful that the, the new CCPO could be that. Um, but in its current state, it isn't. And I want to say on record, again, you know, we had 20, well, 48 hours to be able to amend the, the ordinance language before voting on it. And I do look forward to working with my colleagues um, in the next week uh, to make the amendments needed so that uh, we don't undercut the effectiveness of police oversight, um, which this current ordinance language does. Um, but because I believe that there is consensus that community oversight should be funded, I'm absolutely supporting this uh, amendment. Um, and again, really look forward to working with my colleagues in the next coming days to uh, correct the problems that many residents, you know, have contacted us about, about the current ordinance proposal. Thank you, Council Member Wansley and Council Vice President. Um, I will second the motion. The uh, amendment has been moved and seconded. Are there any questions from Council Members? Councilor Payne. 
Council Member Payne. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, yeah, without objection, uh, I was wondering if I could be marked as an I for the First Amendment. Sure, absolutely. I see the clerks are nodding their head. <laughs> Thank you. All right, not seeing any uh, further discussion, I'll ask the clerk to call the roll. Councilmember Payne. Aye. Wansley. Aye. Rainville. Aye. <coughs> Vito. Aye. Ellis. Aye. Osman. Aye. Goodman. Aye. Chavez. Aye. Chiktai. Aye. Johnson. Aye. Vice President Palmasano. Aye. Chair Koski. Aye. There are 12 ayes. That carries. Our next amendment is from me and the Council Vice President. I will be introducing the amendment. Uh, Council Vice President Lene Palmasano and I are requesting $102,050 in ongoing funding for a public safety auditor for the City Auditor's Office Internal Audit Division. Public safety operations are in the high risk category of the City of Minneapolis operations and for that reason merits continuous monitoring to provide this monitoring, our internal audit division needs a dedicated staff member whose sole focus is public safety operations. The mission of the public safety auditor will be to serve the city of Minneapolis and the public interest by providing objective services that enhance our ability to manage risks, improve internal controls, optimize efficiencies, reduce costs, and strengthen accountability within our public safety operations. The public safety auditor will provide the services normally provided by internal audit, ongoing risk assessments, audits, and consultations and investigations, but with a focus on public safety operations and the city departments who engage in public safety operations, which are 911, emergency management, fire, neighborhood safety, and police. The public safety auditor will provide oversight over our public safety system and will serve as an institutional check and balance on the executive branch's authority over public safety operations in the city of Minneapolis. Our public safety system here in the city of Minneapolis is evolving, and we need to evolve with it. In this government structure proposal, internal city auditor Ryan Patrick requested the addition of one FTE public safety auditor to the internal audit division in 2023, and one FTE public safety auditor to the internal audit division in 2024. This amendment meets interim city auditor Ryan Patrick's request for one FTE public safety auditor in 2023, and allows the mayor and the city council to revisit the discussion of adding an additional public safety auditor in 2024. This amendment will move one non-sworn FTE from the police department at a cost of $102,050 to the city auditor's office, internal audit division, and while the city council does not have the authority to choose which one non-sworn FTE will be cut from the police department, it is our recommendation that the police department cut one of the two vacant law enforcement auditor positions in MPD. If the police department were to cut one of the two vacant law enforcement auditor positions at MPD, the remaining law enforcement auditor position could continue to provide the more on the ground services such as reviewing police operations, internal controls and systems, identifying areas of improvements and recommending enhancements to operations. And if the police department cuts one of the two vacant law enforcement auditor positions at MPD, when the mayor and the city council revisits the discussion of adding an additional public safety auditor in 2024, we can discuss whether we should add an additional law enforcement auditor position in MPD as well. I'll note that in preparing to bring this amendment before the budget committee, I met with Commissioner Cedric Alexander, Chief Brian O'Hara, and interim city auditor Ryan Patrick to discuss the purpose of the amendment and the impacts of the amendment on the police department. I've been working with the interim city auditor Ryan Patrick and council vice president Lene Palmasano since the beginning of my council term to bring forward a public safety auditor position for consideration. And I'm proud to put it forward for consideration at this time. And with that, as a formality, I'll ask, is there a second to this motion? Second. The amendment has been moved and seconded. Are there any questions from council members? I am not seeing any questions, so I'll ask the clerk to call the roll. Council member Payne. Aye. Wansley. Aye. Rainville. Aye. Vita. Aye. Ellison. Aye. Osman. Aye. Goodman. Aye. Chavez. Aye. Chugtai. Aye. Johnson. Aye. Vice President Palmasano. Aye. Chair Kosky. Aye. There are 12 ayes. That motion carries. We are next on to amendment number five. Uh, this is from Council Member Ellison. Council Member Ellison, please introduce your amendment. Thank you much. So, uh, thank you very much, Chair. 
Uh, you guys might notice that the amendment, uh, this amendment looks a lot like the last amendment. Uh, the position, uh, the auditor position in the police department uh, that we just moved, and I think that uh, Councilmember Koski just made a really compelling case for why to move, um, was envisioned as a pair of auditors in that department. Uh, I think we should be keeping the pair together. Uh, it's an audit position. I think it belongs in the auditor department. Uh, I know that we can always revisit this conversation to add these positions in later years, uh, but I think right now is the right time for us to start setting the groundwork, not only for uh, uh, these auditors who are going to specifically be focused on MPD issues, but also um, in preparation for the uh, for the, the 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 monitor that we're going to have for the various consent decrees that we are um, uh, in negotiation uh, 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 to be under. Uh, and so this simply keeps the two auditors that were envisioned to be a pair in MPD uh, and keeps them a pair within uh, uh, what I think is the appropriate department, which is the audit department. Uh, and uh, that's all I got. And I will um, uh, and I will, you know, uh, move approval of this of this motion. I'll make a motion. That amendment has been moved and seconded. Are there any questions from council members? I'm in stack. Oh, Council Member Wanzi. Thank you, uh, Chair. Um, I just wanted to say for the record, I also support this amendment. Um, even earlier this year, uh, MPD came to this body stating how this position would be helpful to uh, accountability. Um, audit is also in a unique uh, position and in it being um, independent, um, and I believe that these positions were put into MPD, um, you know, or basically the reasons why these uh, positions being moved into MPD is actually factor a lot as to why uh, we have not seen a lot of applicants flow into uh, fulfilling these positions, and it does seem like there is a major conflict of interest um, in having these positions stay solely in MPD. Um, and, you know, I think with them being moved to audit it, there could be that, that thorough professional audit uh, function that's going to be needed to support our accountability efforts and oversight efforts over MPD. So I'm really excited about this amendment and look forward to supporting it. Thank you, Councilmember Wansley. Seeing any other further discussion? Um, I am not seeing anything, so I will ask the clerk to call the roll. Council Member Payne. Aye. Juan. Aye. Rainville. Aye. Vita. Aye. Ellison. Aye. Osmond. Aye. Goodman. Aye. President Jenkins. Aye. Chavez. Aye. Chugtai. Aye. Johnson. Aye. Vice President Palmasano. Aye. Chair Kosky. Aye. There are 13 ayes. That carries. We are on to our next amendment. This is from Councilmember Wansley. Councilmember Wansley, please introduce your amendment. Thank you, uh, Budget Chair. Um, so this amendment is simply about allocating our research contracting dollars to align with the government restructure. You know, starting in January, uh, the new legislative department is going to be tasked with supporting uh, this council with our legislative and policy making functions through nonpartisan research, evaluation and analysis. Um, and while we continue to grow this new legislative department, you know, more dollars in FTE should be allocated. But this twenty five thousand dollars from four departments is a modest first step that will have a tremendous impact as the city auditor establishes the foundation of this department and help us as policymakers um, take on important issues um, this, this upcoming year. So just wanted to give them the resources to do that. All right. Uh, that amendment has been moved. Is there a second? Okay, it has been moved and seconded. Are there any questions from my council members? I see Council Member Vita. Sorry. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I just had a question about um, where the funding is going to be pulled from. This, this is the one where there's um, four different funding streams, correct? 
Correct. So uh, the funding streams will come from uh, the contractual service, specifically professional service of the four departments, which includes CPEB, which has currently $5.1 million in their professional contracting service budget. Um, the second department will be health, which currently has $4.6 million in their professional contracting servicing budget. PWI, Public Works, also has $17.3 million in their professional contracting service budget, and then REC services, which currently has under $1 million in their contractual professional service uh, budget. So it'll be coming from those four, from those specific funds. Thank you for that clarification. So my concern is um, specifically around the $25,000 that's coming out of the health department. It is my understanding that um, this could possibly cause some hardship in that department. So I'm willing to support, but maybe we look at uh, some of the larger, you just named some departments, I think you said 17 million or something like that. Like if we could look at maybe reallocating the money to those three departments instead of all four and uh, leaving health out of it. Uh, thank you, Vita. Um, we've been in conversations with uh, uh, Commissioner Heidi around this particular amendment. I think, of course, we would like to see next year as we talk about this, like other ways in which we can, you know, fulfill that gap. But the 25000 felt ma manageable, at least for this year, to give us that, that gap coverage. Thank you. I see we have Miss um, uh, the director, Miss Ritchie. Would you mind coming up and helping us understand the impacts of the 25000 <laughs> Thank you, Chair Koski, for the question um, and council members. Um, so my understanding is with the ongoing funding, we wouldn't really be able to use contractual funding for that because we would need to look at an ongoing funding source. And with those con contracts, they're generally one time. Um, and so we would have to probably look at personnel costs. We have a very, um, very small a non-personnel general fund, and so we don't really have any other general fund to pull from. We have a little bit in our opioid fund and a little bit in our sustainability, but other than that, we just don't really have a lot that's non-personnel. Thank you, appreciate that. And Councilmember Chavez? Uh, I would want to offer a friendly, thank you, Budget Chair Koski, a friendly amendment to strike out the health department contractual services and then I'll need some help from the clerk's office here, but make sure that like there's still the same amount of money allocated, but with the three departments instead of having the health department there. So like 33,000 per department instead of the 25,000. Uh, <clears throat> Madam Chair, uh, and through the chair to Council Member Chavez, I think that um, we can certainly accommodate that change, but I would want to give the budget department who's present and those departments that are impacted a chance to confer maybe in the hall about the impact of increasing that amount from those. Um, and so if it's the bodies, uh, you know, if you would indulge that, I think just to make sure that the increase to those other three is certainly within their scope, that would give us a chance to come back and know that what that impact is. Happy to make the, the change, but if, if the body were to maybe move to the next one, given that we're moving and that they can confer and come back and tell us what the amounts are, it may be that it's not an equal distribution in order to minimize any impact, if that's okay with you all. Okay, we have a few people that jumped in queue here. I have Council Member Goodman and then Vita. Um, and then just a reminder, we I think we've jumped into the council queue to move yourself back into the budget committee queue, but Council Member Goodman. Thank you, Madam Chair. I thought I heard Councilmember Wansley say this was a one-time thing. Did I not, did I not hear that correctly? Yes, it is a one-time cost. So, so that's why so I said yeah. I think I, I yeah. kind of feel like um, she spread the pain. No, I see people change, shaking their heads. Uh, I kind of feel like what she did was she took an approach of kind of sharing it around a bunch of different departments, and I feel like it puts us in this very odd position of saying, well, we like health more than public works, or we like police more than we like CPED. That feels a bit uncomfortable, and I feel like Council Member Wansley spread it out to spread it out. Now, if there isn't $4.1 million in contractual services in the health department, um, that's what Council Member Wansley said there was. So $25,000 is a drop in the bucket. I'm just curious why we're getting different shaking heads from different people. And I don't want to be put in the position of 
choosing departments and department heads we like more than others to take money from because some have lobbied against any reduction in their budget. Madam Chair, not, yeah. I want to make sure I just correct. I shook my head the wrong way. This is ongoing it cuts is. to yeah. those departments, not one time. And so to clarify, it's an ongoing cut to any of the departments that are listed. If we reduce the health department from this, we're talking 8,300 plus some dollars that come that go to the other three that remain. Again, happy to do that if that's the body's pleasure. Okay, I see Councilmember Vita. It's not that. I, I was just going to make a suggestion. Maybe the coordinator's office is another option instead of the um, health department. And um, I'm not trying to stick it to anyone, Lisa. I'm just trying to meet the needs of the health department that, so they don't have to go into personnel funding. So I I know we have a friendly amendment put on the on the on the plates here. I'm wondering, Councilmember Wansi, how do you feel? Um, I do you want just to want the to original or go back to your friendly amendment? Um, I like the original, except though I did I was intentional, as Councilmember Goodman noted, that yes, one correction. This is ongoing funding. Also, to spread this out, and it might be good to have Commissioner Heidi come back up in noting that. Where is the, the 4.1, sorry, $4.6 million that we were looking to take this $25,000 from? I think we can have ongoing conversations about next year again, like what we can do to fill that gap. Um, but we felt pretty confident around that $4.6 million, hand, hand, at least handling that reduction. But I'm also supportive of Councilmember Chavez's motion. Um, I would like to move forward with that motion um, and trust that we can have ongoing conversations with the three departments around that source. Okay, Councilmember Chavez, do you mind just uh, repeating or maybe the clerk can repeat what the, yeah. the, the new amended motion is? Uh, Madam Chair, I, I won't be able to repeat the total motion, but if the motion before us is to take off number four on item six, this is amendment number six from Wansley, it leaves in play the Public Works Department, the CPED Department, and the Regulatory Services Department. It increases the deduction from each of those departments by approximately $8,333 meaning that each department's contribution moves from $25,000 to approximately $33,333. I conferred with the budget director to confirm that. So if you strike four and increase the remaining three from $25,000 to $33,333, we capture the same total amount that was intended in the original motion, but cut health from the um, list of departments that are impacted. All right, thank you so much. Um, and if there aren't any other directors that would like to speak to this, uh, then we will go ahead and I will ask the clerk to call the roll. Is this on the amendment? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, Madam Chair, I, my understanding is it's on the motion which includes Council Member Chavez's amendment. Mm -hmm. Correct. Right. Council Member Payne. Aye. Wamsley. Aye. Rainville. Aye. Vita. Aye. Ellison. Aye. Osman. Aye. Goodman. <coughs> sorry, sorry, I didn't hear. No. Thank you. President Jenkins. Aye. Chavez. Aye. Chugtai. Aye. Johnson. Aye. Vice President Palmasano. Aye. Chair Kosky. Aye. There are 12 ayes and one nay. That motion carries. We are now on to our next amendment. This is number seven. This is from Councilmember Wansley and the Council President. Uh, Councilmember Wansley, please introduce the amendment. Thank you, uh, Chair Koski. Um, so this $100,000 that um, is included in this amendment will be leveraged with the $650,000 from the Green Infrastructure Fund um, that is currently funded through stormwater fees. Uh, this combined effort between stormwater funds um, and general funds allows the city to establish a comprehensive green infrastructure maintenance program that would maintain city-owned land. It will also establish a long-term sustainable landscaping program Program that would build green job uh, pipelines for youth who are looking to build you know their careers um, this investment in 
uh, into sustainable landscaping. We'll create two FTEs next year and we'll build into a team of six FTEs by 2026. Um, residents, you know, especially those who live in areas that are currently impacted by climate change and will largely be, you know, more faced with issues from climate change, uh, will of course receive abundant benefits from this program. Um, and I just want to also thank Council President Jenkins um, for uh, co-authoring this with us. Um, this is definitely responsive to a lot of the work that we've been moving um, in the Public Works Committee around uh, strengthening not only our green workforce, but also really strengthening that um, in tangent with uh, green infrastructure efforts as well. Um, I did want to note too that you will see a revised um, addendum or a copy of this motion in front of you. Uh, we spoke with a number of council members as well as uh, Commissioner uh, Margaret um, Anderson Kelleher about the funding source on this. Um, so we wanted to uh, update that funding source to be absorbed uh, by public works and with their professional contract dollars um, to absorb this as an ongoing cost as opposed to um, having that be split between HR and health. So I did also wanna note the change to the funding source for this uh, amendment as well. Thank you, Councilor Monzi. As a formality, I'll ask is there a second to this motion? Second. That amendment has been moved and seconded. Are there any questions from council members? Uh, let's see here. I have Council uh, Council President Jenkins. Thank you, Madam Chair. And I just wanted to just state, you know, uh, my gratitude to Councilmember Wansley for bringing this motion forward, and I'm happy to be a co-author. I think. Not only does it support our green jobs initiatives and uh, climate change goals, but also I think can help create safety uh, in terms of maintaining these traffic circles, curb uh, plantings, et cetera, that sometimes grow out of control and can conflate sight lines for uh, residents, et cetera, et cetera. So, Really happy to support this uh, motion today. Thank you. I see Councilmember Rainville. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, I also want to pass my thanks on to Councilmember Wamsley for this amendment. Uh, as we realize pedestrian safety, traffic calming includes traffic circles, uh, pedestrian refuge, which is my favorite. Uh, I think of the, the recently installed one on 2nd Street, Northeast, and 3rd Avenue, and it's terrible. There are weeds in that that are hip high. It doesn't have to be that way. So uh, thank you. I will be supporting this amendment. Not seeing any other discussion, uh, I will ask the clerk to call the roll. Councilmember Payne. Aye. Wansley. Aye. Rainville. Aye. Vita. Aye. Ellison. Aye. Osman. Aye. Goodman. Aye. President <coughs> Jenkins. Aye. Chavez. Aye. Chugtai. Aye. Johnson. Aye. Vice President Palmasano. Aye. Chair Kosky. Aye. There are 13 ayes. That motion carries. All right. Our next amendment is from Councilmember Vita. It is my understanding that Councilmember Vita has pulled the original version and has submitted a revised version. We should all have that in front of us. This is number eight. Um, and so, Councilor Vita, could you please introduce your amendment? Thank you, Chair Koski. Yes, my amendment is for $300,000 to be allocated to, the, uh, to North Minneapolis for light improvements, for LED street light improvements, and this amendment is specific uh, to the north side. And yet, you are correct, the amount has changed from the original. Hopefully, everyone has the revised. Thank you. Councilmember Vita, is there a second to that motion? Second. That amendment has been moved and seconded. Are there any questions from my council members? I am not seeing any questions. I will ask the clerk to call the roll. Councilmember Payne. Aye. Wamsley. Aye. Rainville. Aye. Vita. Aye. Ellison. Aye. Osman. Aye. Goodman. Aye. President Jenkins. Aye. Chavez. Aye. Chugtai. Aye. Johnson. Aye. Vice President Palmasano. Aye. Chair Kosky. Aye. There are 13 ayes. That motion carries. 
Uh, our next amendment is from Councilmember Chugtai. Uh, this is number nine. Councilmember Chugtai, please introduce your amendment. Um, thank you, Chair Kroski. This is motion number nine um, on neighborhood traffic calming and traffic calming measures. This um, amends the uh, the existing operational um, fund uh, um, within the public works general fund um, to appropriate $150,000 one time for traffic calming for the neighborhood traffic calming program. Um, in 2023, the operating cost budget in this fund has $100,000 allocated in it. It's a total of an $8 million fund. Um, and this change item allocates an additional $50,000 uh, to this work. For context, that's half of a percent of this total fund, which is just one section of the total public works bu budget. It's... Um, it's barely a drop in the bucket. <clears throat> and this would pay for an additional five to 10 neighborhood traffic calming projects being completed. If this is uh, approved by um, this body, then a total of 15 to 30 projects would be completed across the city in 2023, fully paid for by the city of Minneapolis, adhering to a new equitable and transparent process that our public works team has been working to implement for the last two years. Um, I am um, I'm bringing this item forward um, with the hope that we can get a few more of these really important projects funded across our wards. Um, and thinking specifically about this as the as a council member representing our, our highest rate of high injury network streets and knowing that I deal with this issue every day and that all of you do too. Um, with that, I will move this for approval. Thank you, Councilmember Chug Tai. Is there a second to this motion? Second. second. <laughs> There's a fight to the second. Uh, that amendment has been moved and seconded. Are there any questions from council members? I see we have Council Member Goodman first. Thank you, Madam Chair. I haven't had an opportunity to talk to Council Member Chug Tai, but good for you. I think this is a really good thing to do. I have been <clears throat> critical of the public works process to deal with traffic calming because when you know that we have 6,000 requests and we encourage neighbors to tell us what their traffic calming priorities are and we get, I don't know, five, 6,000 requests and we say we're gonna do 10, I would say why even bother? Um, so it just seems to me that this was a really good thing to do and I'm sorry I didn't get a briefing on this in advance but I strongly support it and I'm gonna guess that lots of other people do too. Sorry to jump in. No, oh, perfect. Um, now, next we have Councilmember Osman. Oh, thank you, uh, Madam Chair, and thanks, Councilmember Chuktai, for really bringing this forward. We I had a conversation with her last night, and um, it's uh, you know traffic safety is a real concern in uh, some of the districts, uh, especially Ward Six. Myself and my office have asked many times in Public Works to do something about this and um, you know get those flashing lights one of the uh, very very busy uh, uh, streets in the city that uh, children play and children cross uh, it's very unsafe and you know if if our office is having difficult for really you know letting the department know that this is uh, we need this service to be done uh, then I don't know how the public will be listened to so this is a great start, and I'm hoping that we can increase uh, more funding here in the upcoming um, budget process. So thank you, Councilmember Chuktai. Thank you. Next, we have uh, Councilmember Vita. Thank you, Chair Koski. I, too, just wanted to say thank you so much, Councilmember Chuktai, for this amendment. It is much needed in all of our wards, I'm sure. And, um, yeah, I just appreciate you bringing this forward. Thank you so much. Thank you. Next, we have Councilmember Payne. Thank you, Madam Chair. Yeah, I'm just going to echo everyone else's sentiment. Um, <clears throat> I think traffic speed has been, you know, one of the biggest areas of constituent complaints recently. And, and I mean, statistically, it's one of the most, you know, traffic deaths and injuries is more common than it ought to be. And this is one of those really data-driven ways of addressing some of those concerns, especially in light of... Um, you know, re-evaluating what the right 
and proper role of our police department is as it relates to traffic and speed. And I think that smart investments in infrastructure is just such a great way to prioritize our investment. Thank you. Uh, next, we have Councilmember Rainville. I, I want to echo uh, Councilmember Payne's about the un needless deaths, and, and thank you, Councilmember Chuck Dye, for bringing this forward. All right. Um, we have, I don't see any other discussion for this one, so I'll ask the clerk to call the roll. Councilmember Payne. Aye. Wansley. Aye. Rainville. Aye. Vita. Aye. Ellison. Aye. Osman. Aye. Goodman. Aye. President Jenkins. Aye. Chavez. Aye. Chuktai. Aye. Johnson. Aye. Vice President Palmasano. Aye. Cherkovsky. Aye. Oh. Aye. There are 13 ayes. That motion carries. Our next amendment is from Councilmember Chavez. Councilmember Chavez, please uh, introduce your amendment. Yeah, thank you, Budget Chair Koski. So I am amending to appropriate $50,000 of the Public Works Department budget and one time for the development, design, and exploration of a neighborhood trash pickup and employment pathways program. So I was able to work with this amendment with community leaders and Public Works Department itself and basically will support the exploration and design and development of a neighborhood beautification program that will allow unhoused residents, shelter residents, and more folks uh, to get paid to clean up our neighborhoods with an opportunity uh, for them to be able to go into the workforce uh, for workforce development and greater opportunities. So this has been really important in Phillips, in, in my ward, I would say Councilman Osman's ward as well. We know that community members deserve to leave, live in clean neighborhoods. Unhoused residents deserve an opportunity to get good paying jobs to get back on their feet. And this just helps with the idea that in order to address homelessness, we need to address the ecosystem around someone. We need to address mental health, addictions, employment, and housing. And I just hope to gain everyone's support. All right, thank you, Councilmember Chavez. Uh, is there a second to that motion? That amendment has been moved and seconded. Are there any questions from my council members and colleagues? I see Councilmember Osman. Uh, thank you, Councilmember Chavez, for bringing this forward. Um, I just want to let you know that uh, we are dealing with this uh, problem. Uh, as you've seen, uh, the neighborhood of uh, Ward 6 and Ward 9 encampments are more common in that area. We got to keep the public uh, safe. And um, I visited yesterday on, uh, right here on Summit Crossing on uh, see the Riverside um, area. Uh, it's uh, uh, Mindat land, but uh, folks over there really need help. And uh, the smallest thing we can do is kind of make sure that sanitation is available, bathrooms are available, and trash are picked up. So thank you for doing that. Uh, Councilmember Chavez. Thank you. Not seeing any further discussion, I'll have the clerk call the roll. Councilmember Payne. Aye. Wansley. Aye. Rainville. Aye. Vita. Aye. Ellison. Aye. Osman. Aye. Goodman. Aye. President Jenkins. Aye. Chavez. Aye. Chugtai. Aye. Johnson. Aye. Vice President Palmasano. Aye. Chair Kosky. Aye. There are 13 ayes. That motion carries. Our next amendment is from Councilmember Johnson. This is number 11. Councilmember Johnson, please introduce your amendment. Thank you, Madam Chair. This amendment would move uh, three FTEs over to the Performance Management and Innovation Department from MPD. I think we're all pretty familiar with this department's work. They've done an absolute ton of work. I sent out a uh, project list that I had requested from the department. Their workload has only grown uh, as their team is uh, slightly smaller than it originally started. And yet, even just one of their uh, projects alone has had the equivalent savings for MPD of 55 to 80 FTE of sworn officers. They have a huge, heavy public safety focus. And as we're looking ahead at this department, we know we're short-staffed. Having them focused and continued to accelerate the work around public safety in order to uh, find these efficiency savings within the departments is going to pay dividends. I will uh, make a personal note that I used to work for uh, at Target Corporate for a team that is like uh, PMI, and we had uh, proportionally a lot more staff for a lot less consequential work. And so as this team is moving forward, I think it is really important to adequately resource them in order to continue uh, doing this work. And I'm hopeful that over 
the next year that they are able to save far more than these FTE uh, in their department. I also will note that I know that uh, when it comes to FTEs, we are thinking ahead about the consent decree that will be coming down at some point, probably mid-year. Uh, I had a chance to talk uh, with our different teams around that. We obviously have the $2 million in this budget uh, set aside for that, but I think we all should expect that we're going to have to have some sort of amendment uh, mid-year around what our spending is in order to ensure that the department has the resources for this. I've been assured that we can do that uh, procedurally when the consent decree uh, comes down and that that would be something we would plan for and, and leverage our contingency funds for. So I would ask for uh, your support with this amendment. Thank you. Thank you, Councilmember Johnson. Is there a second to that motion? Uh, the amendment has been moved and seconded. Uh, are there any questions from council members? I see we have a few few people in queue. Councilmember Payne. Thank you, Madam Chair. Yeah, I'd be remiss to not speak on behalf of this amendment. Uh, I come to this desk by way of um, performance and innovation, and I can really attest to the uh, fact that the team is mighty, but it is quite small, and it's been able to accomplish a lot given its size. And um, I really think that, uh, you know, starting as a grant-funded team over five years ago now, uh, just the body of work that a small number of FTEs have been able to really contribute to the impact of the city, I think it just just goes to show that it's worth this investment for that type of work to continue and to even grow. Thank you. Council President Jenkins. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. I, I was just curious about the, the statement that um, Councilmember Johnson made regarding the mid-year budget, um, I guess, revisioning. Uh, and I'm curious if uh, the budget um, director can address that. Chair and council members. So in the budget, in the mayor's recommended budget, which you are taking up today, we have reserved $2 million of our uh, obligated fund balance for reacting to the consent decree. Now, those funds will be available when we have uh, an agreement before us. So there's lots of steps between now and then. We need the re initial report from the federal government. We will negotiate and we will come to an eventual agreement about the actions that the city will take. At that point, we can assign funds from this reserve to implement those legal requirements of the consent decree, including things like a monitor or any other required tasks. So. The, the, that $2 million portion is for reacting to the final agreement. I just want to address also we have a contingency within our budget, which is a separate thing. Our financial policies require us to have 1% of our general fund spending held as a contingency to handle any unexpected cost overruns during the year. Um, so that's to handle emergencies. That's not to planfully react to something. So that's for if revenues all of a sudden fall short or if the cost of our service level increases dramatically, that's what that contingency is for. What I believe the council member was referencing is that $2 million set aside for working on the consent decree agreement. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, I guess a follow-up question, Madam Chair, for Council Member Johnson. Is, is that your intent? that we would supplant this with the set aside $2 million? No, my point is that uh, as we have a consent decree before us, when that happens mid-year, that we're adequately resourcing the department based off of that. So that's my statement is that when that comes forward, we're going to know what the need is and we're gonna be able to adequately support MPD with the resources that they need. Uh, thank you. All right. I would like to ask if Chief O'Hara, if you wouldn't mind coming up and speaking to the impacts of the police department with 
this uh, potential motion. Thank you, uh, Madam Chair, President, members of the council. Um, <clears throat> excuse me, my, uh, my only concern in impacts is, is exactly what the, the council member uh, stated uh, in terms of us being prepared uh, for what's coming ahead next year. Um, that's, that's the main concern. Having been through uh, a consent decree process and having collaborated with other people trying to figure this out in other cities across the country, I know what it looks like in terms of being able to uh, have the capacity to deal with that. Uh, and that will require us to have, to have additional people to deal with that. Um, my concern, you know, as I'm, I'm new in this role and learning how the budget process works in this city and in this state, I have learned that the, uh, the sworn staffing for next year is at uh, the, the legal requirement, I guess, for the number of people we must have. So while we're going to do everything possible to fill those numbers, I would imagine that it's possible we would have accruals on the sworn side. Uh, and typically what I would do in my previous role is I would move those accruals into civilian uh, staffing just to, to meet that demand. But what I've learned here is that's not quite that easy, particularly because we're at this, uh, this minimum staffing. So because of that, that's my concern. And I know um, we will be paying a monitor at some point, um, and, and that, that will likely go into the millions. It could be, you know, it, that'll be determined by the agreement, right? So we don't know specifically what that cost would be, um, but I just want to highlight that doesn't actually do anything for us when we pay the monitor. It's up to us to figure this out. Uh, and I think it's likely that um, in addition to just having the capacity within the police department to move quickly, um, to be able to uh, sort of measure where we are in terms of implementation and to be able to check things very quickly, like not waiting for like a formal audit process over the course of a year to then go back and make a change. I need civilian people who can work here and work at my pace so that we're not wasting any time in terms of in terms of making change real and coming into compliance, because every day that goes by will be just costing the city more money. So, and I think it's possible, just from my experience and, and from knowing the experiences of other cities, that we will come to an agreement and likely a monitor will tell us, maybe even a federal or a state judge, that we may need to civilianize some leadership positions uh, or some positions of authority in the police department even further than what we may agree to actually in a document. So those are my only concerns. Um, just being able to have the ability to build capacity in the police department so that we are not wasting time and that we are actually you know, ensuring that we're able to make adjustments before a monitor comes in, takes their time doing assessments, and then issues a public report saying, we're not actually doing what we were, what we said we were going to. Like, that's ultimately what I see happening. Thank you. Appreciate it. Thank you. All right. I see we have a few other council members in queue as well. Council member Osman. Uh, uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, Chief answered my question, um, but I do want to ask PMI director uh, or the leadership if they have asked, um, now how, how, first of all, how many full-time employees they need and in their department to be effective? And have they uh, talked to this uh, during the budget uh, setting with the mayor's office? We can ask, they ask I see if, Director yeah, Smith is yeah. here. Director Smith, do you mind coming up and ask or answering? Good afternoon, Chair Koski, Council Members. Uh, Council Member Osman, can you ask the question again? I just want to be Yeah, how, how many staff would you need in your department to be to do your work? Uh, and uh, adding these three uh, staffs, you know, what kind of work will they be focusing on? And have you talked to the uh, mayor and put a request of um, how many full-time employees you need to do to be more effective in your Job. Thanks. Can I work backwards and answer the questions? The ones, the ones that's freshest in my mind is, uh, we, so we have talked to the mayor's office. Uh, I, along with the interim position, I keep confused. 
myself and my boss, uh, Fatima Moore, city, uh, uh, Deputy City Coordinator and the City Coordinator, Heather Johnson, uh, met with the mayor's staff and told them about the FTEs that we needed for the department. And so we gave them the most ideal scenario as well as the minimum that we need to keep up with the projects that we have now where we're kind of underwater and the upcoming projects. And so that was shared with, with um, the um, mayor's office. We also, with the list of projects that we have, uh, we have 16 current projects that are underway, uh, which um, I'm not sure, I think uh, Council Member Johnson said he set that list out, but if you don't have it, I can send it back to you. But there are 16 current projects underway and another four major projects that will be underway in the new year. And those projects, um, just the public safety work alone, it looms so large that I had to take my entire staff of just, it's, I only have five staff. Uh, we had to take that entire team just to work for almost two and a half years to build the BCR while also working simultaneously on the other projects that we had to work on. So it's always a kind of like borrow and steal from here, do this, do that. And it, it continues to push some timelines back further depending on what looms large at the time. So um, that would be 16 projects and then four additional projects coming on board. And you had one more question, which I Or is that it? Okay. And so, yeah, ideally we would just need two analysts to support each one of the uh, managers that we have um, in our divisions of work because right now we're just moving analysts from one project to another and you have analysts trying to help support 16 projects as opposed to four, which would be more feasible and easier to, to do. I see Councilor Chuck Dye has another question, but do you mind, I have a follow-up question. Um, so could you be a little bit more specific about each of the three FTEs? Could you tell us a little bit about what the job title is, their duties, responsibilities, and what you're expecting from those three FTEs that you uh, would have? Chair Koski, that those three FTEs would be analysts. Um, we have I have a manager that's leaving now, and so one of those positions has to be filled and so that there's an open position, but we need analysts to support the managers of the divisions of work. And those analysts, they do a lot of the data uh, collection, a lot of the research. Um, they support the managers with coordinating things with the different departments that we have to work with because almost all the projects that we work on are uh, multi-department uh, projects. Um, when, we doing, when we're doing metric selections for all of the projects that we work on and mapping out the process that currently exists into the new process that we're gonna use, we have analysts that help support that, that work with the um, managers. And so it's a number of things that we need the analysts to help um, us support the managers with, as well as a lot of the tasks that come along with the trainings that we do around human-centered design and um, evaluation function. So I have to support that work as well. Okay, thank you. All right, Councilmember Tugtai. No questions for you, thank you. Um, I know there's actually, so wanna speak to um, this, this thing that uh, I think Councilmember Johnson talked about when he was introducing the amendment. He mentioned um, the consent decree and I think that kind of got all of us um, it, you know, worried about whether we were touching money that every single one of us agrees is really important. And I think the context here is, you know, one of the, one of the things we've heard about when, um, when touching um, MPD or safety related money in our budget, one of the things we've heard from the administration over and over is, is this red flag um, concern or hesitancy around the consent decree, which I think is why, um, uh, Council Member Johnson brought it up in his in his introduction. The 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 piece that you know Chief O'Hara you talked about you know hiring civilians staff outside of um, 
uh, staff within the department to get in compliance with the consent decree and to be able to do so very quickly instead of waiting for the next budget cycle to do that, you will find overwhelming agreement from everyone up here to do that work. We are all committed to it. That's why the consent decrees um, like implementation and compliance money has a $2 million obligation in our 2023 general fund money. That obligation, that $2 million isn't coming out of your budget. It's actually coming out of a thing that exists in our city's overall budget as a result of our financial policies, which tell us we have to set aside a certain percentage. The director Kruger can correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe it's somewhere around 17, 20% of our total general fund. We have to set it aside as money that isn't allocated for any department, isn't set aside for any, it, it's not touchable money. None of us can touch it. And it's put there so that we don't go into debt, so that we can move it and maneuver if there's, uh, if there's um, some sort of crisis that happens. The pandemic is a really good example of it. Um, and that money account like, adds up to somewhere close to $100 million in every single budget. So that $2 million we're talking about, potentially even more, isn't coming out of your budget. It's coming out of more likely than not, this other general fund obligation. Wanted to just clarify that for everyone. Thank you. All right, next we have Council Vice President Palmasano. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, with every respect to my colleagues here, um, I have a little bit different perspective on this. I will not be able to support this amendment. Throughout this year, this council supported moving the majority of the positions and performance evaluation responsibilities out of OPI and into our new legislative audit department. Then, months later, this body changed its mind and moved those positions back and elevated OPI from a division into a department, now called PMI. That department currently lacks a director to build the work plan for the existing staff so I think it's premature to add three more staff to this department before a work plan has been presented to this council for review and before a director has been officially hired. So I also wanna point out that this department has already gained an FTE through the chief resilience officer position. And so they are already gaining additional staffing through this, that was, a, that was the first, that was the mayor's government structure amendment. Um, once a permanent director has been identified, then I think it's appropriate that they can make a case for additional staffing and resources. Uh, not before, is my own opinion here. Thank you. All right, thank you. I'm not seeing any further discussion. Oh, Member sorry, Payne. Councilmember Payne. Thank you, Madam Chair. I'm confused. Uh, did something change where we don't have Mr. Smith sitting here? I'm, Confused, we don't have a director? To answer Council Member Payne's question, we have a new director role that we've put into this department. We haven't officially, nor would this council officially put Mr. Smith into this position without a process, so. Don't we have a backlog of projects regardless of that HR function? I, I don't know, I don't think that's the part that's relevant to this budget amendment. And my point was simply that we have these additional positions to be filled and to move into or move things around to. And it seems, feels to me premature to then add three more open new FTE positions into it at this point in time. Uh, I, it just seems to me that we, we have a pretty large body of work already owned by that department. We know what the capacity it took to get to where we are now. And we know we have a lot more work that needs to happen on the horizon, likely gonna be informed and mandated by a consent decree. This seems very wise to me to make this type of investment. See, Council Member Wanzi. Thank you, uh, Budget Chair uh, Palmasano. Just, uh, I mean, Budget Chair Koski, Laura, it's been a long week. Um, <laughs> just building off of 
what you just raised, Councilmember Payne. Um, we also have, um, with the health department, um, we have an interim director with Heidi, and yet even in the prior amendments that we supported, it's very clear that we also believe that we want to continue investments in public health despite uh, whatever is happening around the director role, it would make sense if we're allowing that president's of work to happen with the public health department, there should be alignment also with our new office of performance and innovation. Um, so I, I don't see how we could make a, a exemption for a P I'm sorry, I'm still going to call you uh, director Smith OPI, like until we, you know, um, but we, we can make an exemption for public health and not also extend that same uh, support to this department as well. So I don't understand why we're kind of picking and choosing on that basis. Thank you, Councilmember Johnson. Thank you, Madam Chair. I just want to respond to something that Council Vice President said about um, it being premature. You know, in this case, we have a department with an own workload. We know they're adding value specifically on the public safety side. We know there's opportunities around performance management and improvement within the police department. It certainly seems appropriate to me that these three positions would be staffed towards that and helping with that. And I would just say, if we're worried about doing something prematurely, I would be worried about prematurely saying with the consent decree, we know for certain that these three positions are going to be needed for that, even though we have funding available for that. And this whole body is committed to giving the resources MPD needs uh, using all of our financial policies to respond to that work. Thank you. I'm not seeing any further discussion from my colleagues. We have the amendment offered by Councilmember Johnson, and I will ask the clerk to call the roll. Councilmember Payne. Aye. Wansley. Aye. Rainville. No. Vita. No. Ellison. Aye. Osman. No. Goodman. No. President Jenkins. Aye. Chavez. Aye. Chuktai. Aye. Johnson. Aye. Vice President Palmasano. No. Chair Kosky. Nay. There are seven ayes and six nays. That motion carries. And the next amendment is uh, amendment number 12. It's Council Member Wansley. Council Member Wansley, please introduce your amendment. Thank you, Chair Kosky. Um, so this amendment will shift $200,000 in funding away from a youth program run by uh, the Minneapolis Police Department and direct those dollars towards uh, performance management and innovation to study how the city of Minneapolis can move forward with the new program dedicated to victim services. Um, since it is a stated intention of the mayor and the council for the new Office of Community Safety to truly be comprehensive, it's imperative that we begin developing a victim service uh, program Victim services are an important part of comprehensive healing, restoration, and public safety. The Department of Performance Management and Innovation is also ready to bring together stakeholders from across the city and, ex and externally to study victim service models. Um, and this will help us get a sense of what are some of the best practices for supporting residents after tragic events? Um, also, I do want to note, you know, the funding for the study is coming from MPD's Peace Pathways um, and also highlighting the fact that youth have testified, you know, just as back as 2018 about their experience with sexual harassment and inappropriate behavior by officers leading youth programs. And no one as of yet from MPD has explained how they plan to ensure that what happened to those youth never happens again. Um, I also want to note that MPD has three other recruitment programs that are fully funded. Um, so I understand the need for recruitment, but it's also very clear uh, that a youth program is not appropriate at this time. Um, I do want to also take a moment to um, amplify, you know, the support that uh, this amendment has received from Bishop Howell, a, a pastor and community leader who, uh, you know, shared a letter of support for this init initiative with all of you and also is super excited to be part of, of this work at the city. Um, and especially since he sees uh, this need, particularly for victims um, in his community and all across of our communities, um, and wanting to be part of the solution and supporting them. Um, I also want to also thank uh, a previous uh, MPD Youth Explorer a participant and leader, Emma Peterson, for also sharing their support and also um, their enthusiasm about helping be part of a victim service initiative here at the city. Um, so again, there it's very clear 
that there's public support from residents across the city and really having the city take this unique opportunity to do some innovative work around this. And I move this motion. Second. Thank you. <laughs> Tina, you have to ask that this time. All right, this item, uh, this amendment has been moved and seconded. And I see we have a few people in queue. Council President Jenkins. Thank you, uh, Madam Chair. I, I cannot support this motion for a couple of reasons. A, we just passed um, a motion that would increase the staff of the PMI department um, by three people. I, looking at the list, this, this proposed project was one of the projects that they cited as upcoming work. Um, and secondly, I think it's really dangerous that we continue on this slippery slope of picking up work of other jurisdictions, namely the state of Minnesota, Hennepin County, et cetera. And so if this project uh, is desired, I think that it could be accomplished with the three staff that the um, performance management and innovation team would bring on board. Thank you, President Jenkins. Let's see, we have Council Member Wansley. Thank you. Oh, okay, Council Member Johnson. Thank you, Madam Chair. I uh, agree with uh, Council President on this. You know, I had a chance to talk with Mr. Smith. It looks like we lost him here. It sounds like there is a way to get this work done uh, if this funding is not approved, uh, that there might be some other resources available from other funding sources and from these three staff that are available uh, as well. Uh, I don't know if we have either Ms. Moore or our uh, chief uh, interim chief operating officer, uh, Johnston, are able to answer that at all uh, it, without Mr. Smith here, but uh, you know, that's kind of what I'm thinking around this. So, it, it, and by the way, I just wanna say it's important work and so I think it should get done, but it seems to me like there are ways to get this work done uh, without this appropriation. Welcome. Uh, Chair Kosky, Council Member Johnson. Um, so is this specifically to the, this is specifically to the developing the directory piece. I was a little, okay, which, so if you could clarify the question for me, please. I do think that um, P, um, oh, PMI should, now you've got me doing it, Council Member Wansley, PMI should be able to, to take on this kind of work. I know that some of the other different pieces that have, um, that are in, I think, future amendments have also been started by human resources with respect to some of the directories and things like that, but we can talk about that when we get to it. So did I answer your question, Council Member Johnson? You did, thank you. That's a question, okay. Thank you. Uh, next we have Council Member Wansley. Thank you, Chair Kosky. Um, so, and sorry, <laughs> it's from uh, Coronary Johnson, if you could come back up. So from my understanding, you know, I have a conversations um, with uh, also OPI. It was my understanding that, you know, part of their workload had included any type of legislative directive from this directive from this body to do exploration of victim services. Um, just to start there, you're saying that there, that has happened though in terms of how this work would be factored into existing workload for OPI. Uh, Chair Kosky, Council Member Wansley, what I'm saying is, uh, is that with three new staff people, the, the work can be reallocated to, um, to work on these types of activities. So follow up of that in terms of just, and I wanna note that this is not a referendum on capacity, it's a referendum of does this body see a prioritization of victim service work? You know, that's something that we would like to move forward. And if so, would you then recommend, is this something we take up through a legislative directive to say, hey, this body is in support of it, OPI has the resources and capacity to do this now, is that more of a appropriate direction to make sure that there's alignment around this? 
Council Member Kosky, um, or Chair Kosky, I apologize, Chair Kosky, Council Member Wansley, I think as we move into the first quarter, we've talked about having some more uh, clarification of work plans with respect to some of these types of um, issues. And in that case, um, that would be an appropriate time to have that conversation um, about prioritizing some of those uh, policy directives. So, Please forgive me. I'm just a little confused now because uh, you shared uh, interim coordinator that this work is being factored. That's what I'm hearing from um, OPI, that this is already work that they're doing, so that there's concerns that this might be duplicative. But I'm just saying, is, is this work happening? And if so, does the legislative body need to make sure we take a vote to make to ensure that alignment. Council Member Cons uh, uh, Chair Kosky, Council Member Wansley, it's not my intent to say that this work is currently underway. It's my intent to say that um, my understanding of the directions that just happened is that there were three additional uh, positions given to PMI. In that case, this is certainly work that could be prioritized among the work that's uh, associated with those three posi posi positions, if that's the will of the body. Okay. Well, let's take a vote. Oh. All right, Council, Council Member Kosky, uh, I'm sorry, Chair Kosky, Council Member Wansley, the work that I, let me clarify, the work that is underway currently um, is related to the directory, which I think is a subject of a future amendment um, of, of gender affirming providers. I think I had my amendments confused in my head. So did that help? Can I provide, yes, yeah, so the work that we're referring is around my amendment for OPI to then lead a study analysis of a victim service initiative at the citywide level. From my understanding, that is work that is not being taken up right now by OPI. Uh, uh, Chair Kosky, Council Member Wansley, that's my understanding is not currently being taken up, but my understanding is, is that could be something that could be prioritized with the additional staff resources. And I'm saying, yes, yeah, sounds good. And right now, I would like to see us take a vote on whether or not we can prioritize that work as part of this workload that OPI will be taking up now. And then did, before the vote, Councilman Wants, Budget Chair Kossi, if, if, if I may. Yep, uh, yep, I see you in queue, Councilman Chavez. Jim Coordinator Johnson, I did want to ask, before I do take this, well, I, I wanted to ask you a question on if your department would be supportive of a legislative directive to do this work. Uh, Chair Kosky, Council Member Chavez, I am supportive of the will of the body. So whatever the will of the body is, is what we'll move forward on. So, so I, I do think we should take a vote and support Council Member Wansley's to show support for victims today. All right, I'm not seeing any further discussion and we have the amendment offered by Councilmember Wansley. I will ask the clerk to call the roll. Councilmember Payne. Aye. Wansley. Aye. Rainville. No. Vita. No. Ellison. Aye. Osmond. Aye. Goodman. No. President Jenkins. Nay. Chavez. Aye. Chigtai. Aye. Johnson. No. Vice President Palmisano. No. Chair Kosky. Nay. There are six ayes and seven nays. That motion fails. And now we are on to our next amendment. This is number 13. This is from Council Member Vita and Council President. Council Member Vita, please introduce your amendment. Thank you, Chair Kosky. Um, this amendment brought by Council President Jenkins and I is a one-time allocation of $70,000 uh, to help develop a, a public-facing, comprehensive, holistic di directory of providers who offer affirming services to the LGBTQ community, um, to LGBTQ plus communities and communities with HIV. We've had um, meetings with our staff and we're happy to bring this forward. And if the council presidents want to add anything else to that. Uh, Madam Chair, with your uh, permission, Absolutely. Absolutely. I will just um, state that, you know, this, this will be an important directory for our communities, uh, trans and gender nonconforming communities to have do want to ensure that we will have um, an RFP that will seek out um, an appropriate um, organization to develop this directory um, and that 
It includes all people who are um, offering these kinds of services and not show any sort of favoritism to one healthcare provider versus another. Um, and so, yeah, looking forward to um, um, having this directory and hope my colleagues can support this amendment today. All right. I, any other questions or comments? I am not seeing anything, so I will ask the clerk to call the roll. Councilmember Payne. Aye. Wamsley. Aye. Rainville. Aye. Vita. Aye. Ellison. Aye. Osman. Aye. Goodman. Aye. President Jenkins. Aye. Chavez. Aye. Chugtai. Aye. Johnson. Aye. Vice President Palmasano. Aye. Chair Kosky. Aye. There are 13. That motion carries. And now we are on to amendment number 14. This is from Council President, our Council President, or sorry, Council President, Council Member Payne, and Council Member Chugtai. Council Member Payne, please introduce your amendment. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you, Council President, and thank you, uh, Council Member Chugtai, for working with me on this. This is um, moving. Uh, money from Public Works $417 million budget uh, ongoing to our Race, Equity, and Inclusion and Belonging Department to support uh, FTE focused on equity work. We know that uh, that department is uh, rebuilding from a pretty uh, turbulent last couple years, and we know that uh, Ever since the Trans Equity Council uh, was created, they've been asking for more of this capacity, and so I'm really happy that we are um, moving forward with this to, you know, give more capacity for community engagement, give more capacity for policy development, give more capacity for working across all departments to ensure that um, our workforce is just more of a belonging place to be, and our city is a more belonging place to be. So. Um, I think this is gonna be really meaningful for a lot of our marginalized communities, especially our LGBTQ+, our gender non-conforming communities, and I uh, ask the body for support. Thank you, Councilmember Payne. Uh, as a formality, I'll ask for a second to this motion. Second. Okay. And then I see we have Council President Jenkins. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Madam Chair, I, I do uh, want to just emphasize that, you know, while this proposal came forward from the Trans Equity um, Commission, that my intent with this position is that we are able to more broadly um, respond to the needs of the broader LGBT. QIA plus community, um, particularly in light of some of the um, rhetoric that we are hearing around the country um, and, and here in the state of Minnesota as well around the LGBT community and the recent hate crimes that we saw in Colorado Springs, Colorado uh, at Club Q that we really focus this um, position on how are we responding to the broader LGBT community. So hopefully um, the Department of Race and Equity, Inclusion and Belonging um, can incorporate those comments and ensure that we are um, in fact creating a broad um, response to the the needs of that community. Thank you, President Jenkins. I would also like to see and ask if uh, Director Anderson Kelleher would be willing to come up and share what the impact would be on your department if this were to pass. Thank you, Chair Kosky and council members. So respectfully, I think the idea here is an important idea. However, I do need to point out to you all where this money is coming from. The Department of Public Works, like many departments, took cuts during the pandemic to be able to help balance the city budget. 
The mayor recommended a number of positions, service worker one positions, that helps us get closer to back to full complement. I wanna share with you what these workers do. This is a permanent cut to the Department of Public Works with this move. These workers from the position description are the very people who will install the traffic calming. They are the very people who drive skid steers to clear snow. They drive snow plows. They fill potholes. They break up concrete. They do our mowing. They collect our garbage. It is 1.6 FTEs that would be removed from the department. There would be a service impact. And I'm sharing that with you because, like I said, you know, no doubt that everything Councilmember Payne and President Jenkins said are very important things. It's the objection to where the money's coming from. Thank you. I am not seeing any further questions or discussion from my colleagues, so I'll ask the clerk to call the roll. Councilmember Payne. Aye. Wamsley. Aye. Rainville. Aye. Vita. Aye. Ellison. Aye. Osman. Aye. Goodman. Aye. President Jenkins. Aye. Chavez. Aye. Chugtai. Aye. Johnson. Aye. Vice President Palmasano. Aye. Chair Kosky. Aye. There are 13 ayes. That motion carries. And we are on to the next amendment. This is from Councilmember Chugtai, number 15. Uh, Councilmember Chugtai, please introduce your amendment. Thank you, Chair Kosky. Um, this is motion number 15, uh, which is um, implementation for uh, the city's municipal ID program, planning for that, um, for that implementation, creating the plan for it. Um, so I am really excited to bring this, this amendment to our body. Um, I want to break this introduction down into three separate buckets. The first um, is speaking specifically to the half of us on this dais who are new to the city. Um, some context on how we are, came to this place. Um, back in 2018, the city of Minneapolis um, passed, uh, um, the, or passed an ordinance that allowed for the city to establish municipal identification cards. Um, and its intent was to make sure all of our residents um, are able to access a lot of different financial, municipal, cultural amenities in our city. Um, and the goal was for it to be available to all Minneapolis residents, but it was supposed to be impactful to marginalized residents, people who you know, struggle with stable housing and have a difficult time getting um, their identification, people of color, indigenous populations, immigrants, youth, seniors, our transgender community. Um, this change item picks up the work that was started back in 2019, which is dated at this point, um, and a lot has shifted in that landscape, with the same $200,000 allocation that the council adopted back in 2019, um, and that work was stopped after the change item was adopted as a result of concerns by city leaders about the protection of individuals' data due to the state's data practices law. Second, Let's go to the colleagues who were here back in 2018 and 2019. I want you to understand how this amendment is responsive to the concerns you've all raised in years past. I am not saying you were wrong. I am saying we are trying to do something different and things have changed. First to the piece on data practices and people's personal information being um, easily accessible because of the, the state's data practices laws. Things have shifted in unexpected ways. We have a trifecta at the state. Um, there are a lot of people, not including the city of Minneapolis, which we won't know for a fact until we pass our IGR agenda next week, working on remedying this, this discrepancy, this problem within the Data Practices Act. Second, on planning implementation versus actual implementation. The ordinance tells us that actual implementation, so printing the cards and giving them to someone, cannot live with, 
with the with NCR or the coordinator's office or anybody else that actually lives with the clerk's office. What those cards look like and what types of problems they're trying to solve for and how many do we need and exactly how much is that going to cost? That's work we don't know right now because we didn't complete the implementation work, right? Now that the landscape escape has shifted, we need somebody to go out and gather all of that information, go back to all of those partners that were ready to accept municipal ID as a valid form of identification. Some of them don't exist anymore, like one of our financial institutions. Others have an interest in being a part of it. Um, so this gives us time to do that work, knowing that it is not going to be something that the entire NCR department is going to move all of their priorities to get this work done. It's going to move slower. It's going to take time. And doing that while we wait for things to shake out with this legislative session is a good thing. It's, it's forward thinking and planning on this body's part. Third, let's talk about the funding source. Yes, this takes money from the Minneapolis Police Department's money. The source itself is the department's law enforcement support fund. It's where things like our contract with the BCA to help us with investigations or with um, state patrol to help with um, uh, presence and uh, law enforcement in our, in our most dangerous or busiest corridors. That's, that's a good thing. In the time that this fund has existed, it has always underspent what was allocated to it. In fact, it's always been under the million dollar threshold. That doesn't mean that it's not gonna get above the million dollar threshold, right? Um, we have things that have shifted with the sheriff's office and we may enter into a new contract with them. That's great. The base funding for this fund in the mayor's proposed budget is actually $1.8 million. <laughs> Then there's a change item that adds an additional $1.5 million to it, bringing it up to $3.2 million in a fund where historically we've never spent more than a million dollars. That's great. Of course, the goal is always to spend all of the money that's given to you, but realistically, this is a place where we can take some money without risking services and without risking programs and outcomes that we're all committed to. With that, I hope to receive your support on this motion. Thank you, uh, Councilmember Tugtai. Is there a second to this motion? Second. Okay, um, I want to walk through some questions with council members and then also have uh, some of the departments, uh, department heads come up. So first, I would like to see if Chief O'Hara would come to speak um, in regards to the impact of this, uh, if this were to pass. Thank you, uh, Chair, Council Members. Um, I would just reiterate my earlier comments um, in regard to what is coming in front of us next year um, and add on to that the challenges that we do have to actually police the city. Um, I am very concerned sitting here today. Um, we've, we've already lost five FTEs, we know that, uh, just today. I don't believe we were adequately, ad adequately prepared for consent decree even before that. And I'm not a person that wants to wait until we actually have a signed agreement or agreements <laughs> to then actually move funds and start figuring out if we're gonna hire people. I would prefer to have all this stuff done now um, so that we can start making change real, which is more important than wasting money paying a monitor, um, but actually make change real for our people. The other thing I'm concerned about is uh, just the, the level of, of victimization in the city um, with the increasing challenges with staffing. As of today, there's been 523 people that have been shot in the city, and it's absolutely outrageous. It's down from last year, um, but I, and I believe a lot of the reason that's driving that is the increased reliance on our partners. Um, so I hope to be able to continue to do that and to do that even more. But I do anticipate significant expenditures with the consent decree, and um, I'm, just, I'm just not sure where all the money would come from. 
that's all. Thank you. Thank you. And I see we have Councilmember Osman in queue. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, as much as I want to support um, our Chief O'Hara and give him all the tools uh, he needs to succeed, and as much as I support public safety, um, I, I want to kind of highlight that city of Minneapolis, uh, we're honored to have so many hardworking immigrants uh, documented or undocumented. Uh, their safety, it's on the line, depending on who's, in, who's our president. Uh, during the Donald Trump time, many undocumented immigrants had a very hard time living in our city. Uh, that's their safety concern. Uh, really um, admire Council Member Chuck Tai bringing this forward and trying to find, as much as I don't even understand this in municipal ID, I know it has its own tough challenges and um, you know, creating something like this at least is a start and talking about it. And um, uh, we have three immigrant council members in, on the council and we have a large population that are undocumented and we have to be there for them. Um, and um, I will be supporting this and I encourage the colleagues to support and really let's, you know, let's increase uh, more funding for uh, the population, immigrant population we have here, especially immigrants of Office of, Office of Immigration uh, run by Director uh, Michelle Rivero. Uh, we get, I say, I would say maybe, you know, 50% of the calls we get is related to the immigration, in my word. You know, a local council member, uh, you know, it's very, you know, uh, difficult to kind of have a say, but we are honored to work with uh, Senators Klobuchar and Congresswoman in Han and their office to kind of deal with those issues. And, uh, and also our Office of Immigration have been awesome. So um, I'm really looking forward, uh, uh, in, you know, paying more attention to some segment of our population and their need. And uh, thank you, Councilmember Chiktai. Thank you, Council President Jenkins. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, you know, I really want to state I support the intention of this motion. I think, as Councilmember Chuck Tai stated, a lot has changed since 2019. Um, a big part of that change is. Uh, a significant shift at the state legislature, um, really um, creating, I think, some hopeful pathways to a statewide um, driver's license for all. What hasn't changed is the concern about the data um, and that was a real concern for community members um, as well as city leaders, um, our partners who we were working with to try and um, accomplish the municipal ID at the time. And so I'm, I'm hopeful that we can um, count on our legislators to um, bring a workable solution to this uh, very real crisis that we have. Thank you, President Jenkins. Uh, I see Council Vice President Palmasano sitting next, thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I wanted to ask if Director Topinko would be willing to just speak a little bit on the state and how the legislative priorities are. Um, you know, I, my understanding is that the legislature has signaled this is a top priority of theirs, but I, I'm not here to speak for that. You're the director, so if, if you'd be willing to just to comment on how this might articulate with that or not. 
Uh, yes, thank you. I'm Chair Koski and, and Council Vice President Palmasano. Um, yes, we do know that the um, the advocacy organizations that have been putting for, pushing for driver's license for all are gearing up to make a big push this year. We know there is support um, among the Minneapolis delegation. Uh, what we are hearing from them is that there will be an active push for this this year. Um, the governor's office has supported it in the past as well. Um, of course, we. I can never know what the, <clears throat> what the outcome will be um, during the legislative session, but we do anticipate there will be activity around this. There are many other priorities, um, and it's a budget year, so um, again, we can't, can't guarantee what the outcome will be, but we do know there is a lot of support, given the change in the legislature, uh, to, to push for this, and um, it is in the city's legislative agenda to support this as well, and we have in the past, and will continue to do so. Thank you. Thank you, Director Topinga. Uh, next, we have Council Member Chavez. Uh, Chair Koski, thank you very much. Just, I worked at the state legislature for four years before coming here to the city council, so I, I know a lot of the state Minnesota House of Representatives, and I think that this is something that we'll be able to get done at the Capitol, not only driver's licenses for all, but the data privacy. And I just wanna thank Councilmember Chuck Tai for her fast forward thinking on making sure that we secure funding right now to show our commitment and support for our immigrant neighbors undocumented and all immigrant neighbors that we can do something here but this idea isn't just for immigrants it's also for other community members that need this municipal id so i just want to say that like we're going to get it done at the state legislature i know we can do it and we need this funding right now to begin that planning fast forward so thank you councilmember chuck Tai. thank you next we have councilmember rainville uh, thank you madam chair I I see the need, Councilmember Chuck, I, but I am struggling uh, that the state is not helping with this, uh, and maybe even the county can. I believe there's another way to get this done besides cannibalizing the police budget uh, at a time when we have a new chief, we have a new commissioner of safety. The message that we're sending to them by continuously taking away their money it, it, in, my, in my ward is not acceptable. So I will not be supporting this, but I, I do believe there's another way to get this done. Thank you, Councilman Rainville. Um, I'd like to ask uh, City Clerk uh, Casey Carl if you could just maybe I'm new, so trying to understand. You know, Ms. Topinka came up and talked to us about what's happening in the state legislature. What would happen here? Because in my understanding, would be your office would be the actual place where we'd implement this. I know the dollars is going to NCR, but if you could just speak to that a little bit. Sure, Madam Chair, the, and to the council. Uh, when the municipal ID program was adopted by ordinance and established, not yet implemented, um, for all the reasons I think that Councilmember Shugtai adequately summarized, the program administrator was designated as the Office of City Clerk. So that remains on, on um, the code of ordinances that the clerk administers the municipal ID program once it's, if and when it's eventually uh, implemented. Um, I think the the other piece that I would add is that the concern over data practices, which certainly is on our, our municipal platform for the state, continues to be a driving issue for staff since we do not have the capacity to keep private or withhold data we would collect on individuals under the current law. Um, and so that, that was, as Councilor Shugtai identified, the primary motivation for suspending uh, the program uh, until such time as changes at the state legislative level could be achieved. Thank you. I am not seeing any others in the queue, so I will ask the clerk to call the roll. Oh, apologies. Councilor Chugtai. So sorry. I just wanted to sum all of this up real quick. Um, I want to, you know, want to come back to this building public safety um, piece, I really think about the, the people that this type of program could benefit. We don't know exactly how because we have not done the work to figure it out yet. And a lot has shifted, which is why we're fun, why I've brought this amendment to do all of the figure out the details and the logistics work, right? But people who are housing insecure and unstable, people who are uh, homeless, either sheltered or unsheltered, who often lose their IDs or those are stolen, and then that becomes the barrier to them accessing their first apartment, which creates this massive public safety problem for us, for our police officers to deal with, who like 
have far better things to be doing and we need them to be doing. This is thinking more creatively about what safety can look like and coming back to this is not staffing money, this is not overtime money, this is not pathways money, this is, this is money for contracts, two of which we have already entered into and are gonna go through next year, the one with the BCA and the one with State Patrol, right? Those we have already accounted for. On top of that, we could enter into a new contract with the Sheriff's Office. That would be great. But this is one-time money that is likely not going to be used for its designated purpose and is more likely than not going to roll into the general fund just like it did last year or with the 2022 budget, right? So this is not taking money away from hiring more police officers, prioritizing, fulfilling all of our obligations around the consent decree and planning ahead for the consent decree. This is money that would not otherwise be used for its specified purpose. And a small amount of it in the grand scheme of things, $200,000 one time. All right, thank you so much. I am not seeing now any further discussion, but I will give this a second longer than I did before. All right, uh, please clear call the roll. Councilmember Payne. Aye. Wansley. Aye. Rainville. No. Vita. No. Ellison. Aye. Osman. Aye. Goodman. No. President Jenkins. Nay. Chavez. Aye. Chugtai. Aye. Johnson. No. Vice President Palmasano. No. Chair Kosky. Nay. There are six ayes and seven nays. That motion fails. Uh, we are all now moving on to number 16. This amendment is from Councilmember Chugtai, Councilmember Chavez, uh, or both of them. Uh, Councilmember Chugtai, please introduce your amendment. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, this amendment um, is giving money to our Office of Immigrant and Refugee Affairs. Um, really thrilled that we have an office. It is staffed by one person. Um, our director, Michelle Rivero, who does an excellent job. We're very thrilled you're here. Um, and there is, you know, as, as Councilmember um, Osman was just describing a minute ago, half of his constituent calls are related to the immigration um, system. And this is, this is pretty common among all of our, um, our immigration, our immigrant communities. It has always been um, Director Rivero's belief, um, and she, shared, she has shared this with us on the public record in the past, that the best thing we can do as a city in this, in this, in this ecosystem of work is help people get access to permanent documentation and permanent status in, um, in our city. The way we do that, right, we don't work, how's that work um, in, within the city, right? Director Rivero isn't sitting and processing people's um, DACA applications. We work with our existing partners um, and in, in who do this, this work professionally and we contract out money to them and we create programs with them that help people access legal support around navigating the immigration system and that helps us keep Minneapolis residents here safe and secure. Um, this money, $150,000, goes towards expanding that service um, and uh, allowing us to better meet the needs of our immigrant communities, particularly with specific immigration programs um, and documentation programs like DACA being under sign significant um, attack in this moment. So. Thank you, Councilmember Tugtai. I, as a formality, is there a second to this motion? Second. Thank you. There's, this has been moved and seconded. Are there any questions or comments? I see. Chavez. Councilmember Chavez. Uh, thank you, Budget Chair Koski. I'm still processing that last vote, so I hope that we can uh, pass an immigration justice amendment here in this body. For too long, our federal and state government has failed 
uh, in supporting our immigrant communities here in Minnesota. This amendment helps support our community members with immigration related services. As a proud son of Mexican immigrants, I know the dire need of support that we need to navigate in this difficult system. And while this funding stream will not help solve all of our needs, it will help support existing residents and new arriving residents here in Minneapolis. I represent the biggest undocumented community in the entire state of Minnesota. And in Ward 9, the biggest Latino community who is impacted from the lack of funding in these services. When you have seen the deportation of your own community members, like I've seen the deportation of my, of my own family members, you know that this is important. I've seen ICE personally destroy my family, my friends, and my loved ones. And yet, there isn't enough money in this fund. $125,000 is a piece of crumb. It is nothing. And adding $150,000 is a start, and it's still not enough. So I would just ask for unanimous support in this budget vote to show our support for our immigrants across Minneapolis. Thank you. Thank you. I see we have Councilmember Goodman. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. I, I think pitting two things against each other is a terrible way to approach this. This is the kind of thing that I think most everyone would support if the source wasn't out of the police department. I would urge the authors to pull this and come up with a different source so that everybody could support it. I would support it if it came from somewhere else. Uh, is that a, a, a suggestion here to my colleagues of the authors here, Councilmember Chugtai and Councilmember Chavez? Uh, we can put this one aside for the moment and so you guys can have some time to think about this. Would that be helpful? I'm fine with us putting it all the way at the bottom of the list. Okay. I think we should just take the vote. Okay. Okay, we have right. two. And we can just revisit yep, it no, if we fail. I, I'll concur. That's fine. We need to, we oh. need to just keep this process moving along. All right, um, the motion is in front of us, and so I'll ask the clerk to call the roll. Council Member Payne. Aye. Wamsley. Aye. Rainville. No. Vita. No. Ellison. Aye. Osman. Aye. Goodman. No. President Jenkins. Nay. Chavez. Aye. Chibtai. Aye. Johnson. No. Vice President Palmasano. No. Chair Koski. Aye. There's seven ayes and six nays. This carries, and this motion carries, and we're on to the next one. Uh, the next is number 17. We have Councilmember Vita. Uh, Councilmember Vita, please introduce your amendment. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, this amendment is a, a change item that will appropriate dollars from MPD's general fund for public safety contracts with community groups. This will assist in providing public safety services in areas of the city with the highest crime. A particular emphasis will be placed on these areas in the city with the most violent crimes. Community groups will help bridge the divide between the community and MPD while helping to identify crime prevention strategies and opportunities. Thank you, Councilmember Vita. Is there a second to this motion? Second. The, thank you. The, the amendment has been moved and seconded. Are there any questions from council members? Uh, let's see here. I do have council member Wansley in queue. Thank you, Chair Koski. Um, first, you know, I'm supportive of, of funding community groups to fill in the gaps of city services, but I do want to make sure that we're not being duplicative. Um, so I do have some questions for the author. So the city already has the violence prevention fund. Can you share a little bit more about the differences between the pilot program you're proposing and that violence prevention fund? So I'm not proposing a pilot. Um, this is work that has previously been done, but this is um, additional funding that I need within the police department for them to work with community groups. And the other department that does similar work, they have said um, many times to me that they don't work directly with police. And so this is a little different than that. This is uh, community groups who are okay with working with police. So just a clarification, would you like to amend the, the language in your motion? Because it does frame it as a community safety pilot, which I do think that does have some impl implications that it is a pilot then. 
we we can go with it that it's a pilot. But I, I just want to say for the record that there has been previous contracts with community in our police department. So if we're going to stick with uh, it being a pilot, uh, and this might be MPD, do we know then will MPD be the primary evaluator of this pilot in terms of determining metrics of success around it? Well, we have to put an RFP out for this. And so I'm sure as we develop the RFP, we'll work with MPD to figure out what that looks like. And I don't, I, I wouldn't um, support anything that we couldn't find measurables from that didn't have some type of mechanism in place where we measured success. And I'm just saying this for the public record because typically when we <coughs> refer to pilot projects and in a pilot, uh, you typically run a small program, you measure the outcomes closely to inform the creation of a larger program over a preset period of time. Um, and then you use that information to then say, what are the deliverables if we're gonna move forward with the pilot? So knowing that we have a process for a pilot system already in place, just wanted to see if that was being carried over into this. It sounds like it's not. It's not. But it's not? It's not. Okay, thank you. Um, I do want to know as, you know, council members, um, you know, as well as the public to understand that, you know, and knowing that it's not very clear what the metrics of success are for this um, or the goals like from a year or now, like what we can use as a marker of success. Like if, you know, we are gonna be earmarking funds for MPD, I do think that is imperative that we do create those metrics of success so we know um, if these things are actually helping the community. So I do wanna put that on record of like, we do have a process for pilots. We'd we'll love if we continue with that standardized process um, and, just want to put that out. Thank you. Uh, I am not seeing any other, oh, I come, sorry. First I have Council Member Ellison. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, I am, uh, I think I'm supportive of this, but I did want to clarify that in um, OVP, I know there's a new acronym. I can't remember it for the life of me. I'll get it at some point. Um, that, uh, that only the interrupters uh, don't work with the police and that, uh, that there are other programs, which I think are in the right, they have, set, they have you know, probably a dozen other programs um, uh, actually do have cross collaboration, have a lot more flexibility. And so I just wanted to clarify that just so, you know, we uh, don't accidentally sort of misrepresent the, the, the role that OVP has played and, and that they have other departments that do work with the police. Um, only the interrupters don't, is my understanding. Thank you. Uh, Council Member Wansley. Thank you, Chair Koski. Also another clarification point about the Office of Violence Prevention and already a difference I'm seeing with this um, amendment or the pilot that's being proposed with this amendment is that um, this amendment is for groups that do wanna work closely with MPD, but to do something post-crime. So they're kind of a, a rapid response or a reactionary team after a crime or an incident has been committed. Um, so that is something imperative with this fund for groups who might be looking for this. Um, just to continue to clarify the role of OVP, if there are groups that want to continue doing diversion work, prevention-based work, um, getting residents connected to social services, um, that more proactive approach, then the Office of Violence Pre uh, Prevention Fund is the appropriate source to do that work. Um, so I also want to provide that clarification, too, since we're trying to do something different here. Okay. Thank you. I'm not seeing any further discussion. Uh, Councilmember Vita has their amendment before us and I'll ask the clerk to call the roll. Councilmember Payne. Aye. Wadsley. Aye. Rainville. Aye. Vita. Aye. Ellison. Aye. Osman. Aye. Goodman. Aye. President Jenkins. Aye. Chavez. Aye. Chugtai. Aye. Johnson. Aye. Vice President Palmasano. Aye. Chair Koski. Aye. There are 13 ayes. That motion carries. And we are moving to our next amendment. This is, oh, before I get there, I just want to pause for a hot second here. <laughs> it is noon. We've been sitting here for two hours. Uh, we have probably at least a, a, about an hour to go before we need to break before uh, Public Works and Infrastructure Committee meeting. I just want to ask uh, my colleagues, do you guys, we are 
We are trucking along here. I'm just curious to know if anybody wants to stop for a quick break, five minutes, or if we just keep going. Okay, we are going to, um, how do I call this, clerk? Uh, just the I'm going to recess for five minutes, and I mean five minutes. So <laughs> here we go. <laughs> we'll be back at 12.07.
All right, council members, guests, we are going to begin. We are on to number 18. We're in the home stretch here, everybody. Um, let's see, can we do this in one day? Let's think about that, council members. There may be a prize at the end of this if we can. So, all right, uh, our next amendment is by council member Osman. Council member Osman, please introduce your amendment. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, this is a quick one. Uh, this amendment directs $90,000 to Community Public Safety Initiative on Franklin Avenue. One of the neighborhoods I represent hasn't certified with the city and has given up the funding last year because of, of that. I'm simply taking the funds they haven't spent and directing them to the Community-Based Public Safety Initiative on, on Franklin. Franklin Avenue hasn't received the attention from the city like Lake Street and uh, West Broadway has. Franklin is one of the most diverse places in the city and safety needs are profound. So I urge my colleagues to support this. Thank you. Thank you, Councilmember Osman. Is there a second to second. this motion? <laughs> we, I, I hear the second. Uh, the amendment has been moved and seconded. Are there any questions from my colleagues? I do see we have uh, Councilmember Johnson. Thank you, Madam Chair. I'm a little bit uh, nervous about a constitutional equal protections violation on this one. It's very hyper local. I'll note that when I'm looking at the uh, change item documentation, it does not mention any data around crime or safety issues specifically on Franklin. Uh, and I didn't hear that in Council Member Osmond's comments, that justification. I'll note that I have corridors in my ward, for instance, where we've had seriously high increases in crime, where we have residents and businesses asking for additional safety initiatives. And so I think as a body, we need to uh, consider whether we're gonna open up the door to that. I do understand this is from this specific uh, neighborhood uh, association uh, funding that was allocated, but I also think uh, we have to be careful here from a legal element. Maybe I could just turn to our city attorney just to at least clarify around especially hyper-local uh, appropriations and, and my concerns here around the Equal Protections Clause. Chair sure, Kowski, Council Member Johnson. <clears throat> um, the, the, um, the, the language of the motion does not implicate a protected class. And so you're, it's not subject to an equal protection analysis of the highest degree, which would be a strict scrutiny type of analysis. It is a, a, a geographic connotation. You're right, it is hyper-local. And so um, my advice to elected officials um, uh, in, in this instance is to articulate the basis for the hyper-local distinction, the grounding for that distinction. Um, uh, assuming there is a rational basis there, that would be okay. Uh, thank you, Mr. City Attorney. So I think that brings me back to both the documentation on this did not articulate the crime-related uh, issues nor the conversation so far. So maybe some colleagues want to jump in with some data and share the rational basis for this. But I, I have serious concerns and at this point would be voting against this. Um, well, Chicago and Franklin, that's the data. We all know that uh, that code road in that area is... Uh, uh, very high hot spot in our areas. That's what the local police talk about, and that's what's, what's on the news mainly. And um, that's all I can share at the moment, but if you want a data, we can ask appropriate staff to provide those data. Okay, thank you, Councilmember Osmond. I see Councilmember Chavez is in yeah. uh, queue. Budget Chair Kasi, thank you. I share a border with Councilman Osman. I don't necessarily have the Franklin corridor, but I do get a lot of constituent emails about the, the lack of safety efforts in that corridor and just want to express my concern. I know that like we share that border <laughs> and these resources would go on that side of, of, of the area, but I do know like the emails we both get copied on, it shows that there's some safety concerns in this area that need dire support. And I think these, this, this funding won't help solve everything, but if it helps kickstart a safety program in that area, then I'm fully supportive. Thank you. 
All right, I'm not seeing any further discussion. Uh, we have the amendment offered by Councilmember Osman, so I'll ask the clerk to call the roll. Councilmember Payne. Aye. Wamsley. Aye. Rainville. Aye. Vita. Aye. Ellison. Aye. Osman. Aye. Goodman. Aye. President Jenkins. Aye. Chavez. Aye. Chugtai. Aye. Johnson. No. Vice President Palmasano. Aye. Chair Kosky. Aye. There are 12 ayes and one nay. That motion carries, and we are on to our next number 19. This is from Councilmember Chavez. It's my understanding that uh, he had pulled his original version and has submitted a new one, so you should, all of us should have this um, outside of the original packet here. Uh, can you confirm, Councilmember Chavez, that you want to pull this? Yeah, and... that, that is correct, Budget Chair. Great. I will let you now introduce it. Thank you so much. Thank you, Budget Chair Koski. So after extensive conversations with the mayor's office, we came to a decision on a mutually agreed pathway forward that I'm asking my colleagues for support on. I want to bring forward, well, now that it's not really an amendment, it's just revised, thanks to Councilmember Koski. Uh, it will instead have an increase to the CPAD by $150,000. Uh, by reducing MPD 100,000 and HR by 50,000. So what's gonna happen, you'll see on the second page, there's a legislative directive attached to this. So it's gonna assess the data and metrics resulting from the first round of funding for the Community Safety Strategies pilot program and identify opportunities for additional funding to the program in 2023 for its expansion to South Minneapolis and assess options for making the program ongoing. My initial goal was taking $650,000 to bring this program, the Community Safety Special Strategies Program, to South Minneapolis. And this, to some extent, can help still achieve that. It just will have a legislative directive. And one of the reasons for this work, we know that in South Minneapolis, there has been recent you know, gun violence, opioid epidemic, a lot of needles on the ground, and also a lack of work uh, force development not lack, there is workforce development, but it's a, an opportunity to be having workforce development for people in the community and would just want to explain what this was and would ask for everybody's support. Thank you, Councilmember Chavez. Is there a second to this motion? Second. Second. The amendment has been moved and it's been seconded. Are there any questions from my colleagues? Not seeing any, I will ask the clerk to call the roll. Councilmember Payne. Aye. Wansley. Aye. Rainville. Aye. Vita. Aye. Ellison. Aye. Osman. Aye. Goodman. Aye. President Jenkins. Aye. Chavez. Aye. Chugtai. Aye. Johnson. Aye. Vice President Palmasano. Aye. Chair Kosky. Aye. There are 13 ayes. That motion carries. Now we have, uh, Councilmember Chavez did uh, kind of allude to this. We have a legislative directive from Councilmember Chavez. Could you please introduce this? Yes. So for some reason, I thought we were voting on both of them together. <laughs> but as a process-wise, I explained what this was. I thought we did. Basically, this is a legislative directive to explore the expansion of the Community Safety Strategies Program, which right now has $1 million. We just increased it by $150,000. The program has served the Cedar Riverside neighborhood in a neighborhood in North Minneapolis, from my understanding, in Council Member Jeremiah's ward, Ellison's ward. And what this legislative directive does, it just puts a pathway forward to expand that program to South Minneapolis. Thank you, and I just wanna confirm everybody has seen this, it's 19A, it's uh, with the revised. Thank you, um, do we have a second to this motion? Second. All right, that has been moved and seconded. Are there any questions from my council members? I'm not seeing any, so I will ask the clerk to call the roll. Council member Payne. Aye. Wansley. Aye. Rainville. Aye. Vita. Aye. Ellison. Aye. Osman. Aye. Goodman. Aye. President Jenkins. Aye. Chavez. Aye. Chugtai. Aye. Johnson. Aye. Vice President Palmasano. Aye. Chair Kosky. Aye. There are 13 ayes. That motion carries. We are now moving on to number 20. This is also from Councilmember Chavez. Could you please introduce your amendment? Budget Chair Kosky, thank you. This was in regards to the Lake Street Safety Center. I actually worked on this with the chief. Um, it basically, we've also been working with the Lake Street Greenway Partnership and members on reestablishing a former site known as the Lake Street Safety Center. It's where non-police, public safety personnel with support from Hennepin County, our Minneapolis City Attorneys and more will be located. And we're expecting to start it in 2023. 
but this would just commit the city of Minneapolis to being a partner in this work and establishing the safety center on Lake Street. And I would just ask for everyone's support. Thank you. Is there a second for this motion? Second. The amendment has been moved and seconded. Are there any questions from my council members? I see council member Rainbow <coughs> is in queue. Thank you, Madam Chair. I do have a question for council member Chavez. How does this fit in with the reestablishment of a third precinct in the third, uh, third precinct? How, how does that all work? Yeah, so this is, uh, I know that MPD was asked if they wanted to be in the safety center, and I think the answer was a no, but this would help basically establish a safety location for non-police personnel, like our city attorneys and Hennepin County, so it doesn't, this is not for the third precinct, this is like a separate thing, but in theory it should be helping with a safety mechanisms in the area because there would be non-police public safety resources there. So this is in cooperation? It's separate. Two different things. Yep. Sorry. I... Okay. Thank you. Do, do you have a follow-up question, Councilman Reba? Well, I'm I'm just puzzling why you would advance this uh, instead of a, a new third precinct. That means we would have to make one hundred million dollars in a budget amendment. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, President Jenkins. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. And maybe I can help <laughs> Council Member Rainville understand a little bit too. Um, but so to your point about the third precinct, which I think we could have brought that up around the crime on Franklin Avenue as well. Um, we we really need to be thinking about how do we replace the third precinct because I think a lot of the problems that we are experiencing in South Minneapolis is due to the fact that the third precinct is across the street and my residents live in South Minneapolis. But that's another point. Um, I want to ask uh, Councilmember Chavez, and I, I do support this motion, but do we know if Hennepin County is contributing to this safety center. Um, and prior to, before you answer that question, I wanted to finish answering for Councilmember Rainbill. So a safety center existed in conjunction with the third precinct uh, for many, many years, for decades prior to <coughs> the uprisings of 2020 and the subsequent burning down of the safety center. The Lake Street uh, partnership is um, wanting to bring that safety center back um, as a, in addition to the work that the third precinct does. I'm surprised to hear that the MPD has said they don't want to be a part of that safety component. Um, and I think we can continue to discuss that. But <laughs> Council Member um, Chavez, do you know if Hennepin County is going to be a partner in this yes. safety well, center as well? I know that Hennepin County will have like a kiosk for resources there. And I know the goal is to have the city of Minneapolis, Hennepin County, and Metro Transit contribute $75,000 total in a year, this year, oh, the following <coughs> year when it's established. So the reason for that is to cover the cost of like a, a coordinator and the rent of location. And the reason for this $25,000 amendment is to establish one third of that cost between three different government partners, City of Minneapolis, Hennepin County, and Metro Transit. Thank you. You have my commitment to make sure that we can get that done. Thank you. And then subsequently, do we know is there a location proposed? Right now they're thinking in the Midtown building, the Midtown Gold Market, yep. Thank you, Council Member. <clears throat> All right, thank you. We have Council Member Wansley. Thank you, Chair Koski. Um, I just wanted to um, also share some updates. I heard the third precinct be referenced a couple of times. I do want to remind Council this, you know, past our procession, um, we did pass an amendment that I brought forward to do an engagement process around the third uh, precinct that NCR is leading right now. Um, and that will 
uh, greatly shape what is going to happen with that site. Um, I want to also put on record for the multiple community sessions that I've been part uh, a part of that has been led by the surrounding community. They have said they do want to see something else in that site besides law enforcement. So I'm really excited to see community has already uh, expedited conversations around, um, you know, the third precinct, the future of that site. Also, what happens with uh, you know, the third precinct as a law enforcement uh, facility. And I also want to note too, because this has even come up in um, events that I've hosted in my ward uh, around, you know, concerns of distance and response time with the current third precinct being located in the old PSB center. Um, I want to remind, you know, MPD came to a PHS several months ago and provided a very thorough uh, presentation where it says currently their response times is eight and a half minutes. So if that is accurate, then it does not seem to be actual matter of distance or troubles with distance from law enforcement stationed at the third precinct traveling to uh, residents within the third precinct boundaries. So that's even data being provided by MPD themselves. So I do want to uh, somewhat do some myth busting about response times um, based off of the data that our own uh, law enforcement department provided us just you know several months ago. So I did want to highlight that fact that work is happening around the current site of the third precinct, the future of that is being led by community, um, and also you know concerns around response time based off of the current locality of the third precinct. Thank you. I'm not seeing any further discussion. So we have this amendment offered by Councilmember Chavez. I will ask the clerk to call the roll. Councilmember Payne. Aye. Wansley. Aye. Rainville. Aye. Vita. Aye. Ellison. Aye. Osman. Aye. Goodman. Aye. President Jenkins. Aye. Chavez. Aye. Chugtai. Aye. Johnson. Aye. Vice President Palmasano. Aye. Chair Kosky. Aye. There are 13 ayes. That motion carries. We are on to our next amendment, which is from Councilmember Chavez and Councilmember Chugtai. This is number 21. Uh, Councilmember Chavez, will you please introduce your amendment? Yes, thank you, Budget Chair Koski. Prevention is key in our neighborhoods with high rates of carjackings and theft. This amendment will help improve education and helps to establish a program to prevent auto theft and catalytic, conver catalytic, catalytic converter theft. <laughs> It will appropriate $25,000 in one-time funding from the Apple's Police Department to support auto theft prevention. St. Paul has an auto care clinic that marks catalytic converters and installs theft prevention screws and license plates. I think that with this appropriation, we can begin the exploration of bringing a program to Minneapolis. And if Councilmember Chuktai, who's an author out here, would like to say something. Thank you. Yes, Councilmember Chuktai. Uh, thank you, Chair Koski. Uh, really excited to have worked on this project with Councilmember uh, Chavez. Um, I, I represent the 10th Ward that's entirely in the 5th Police Precinct, and um, I know that the, the neighborhoods I represent, particularly in the um, northeasternmost corner of of the fifth precinct has always been um has always uh, had the highest rate of auto thefts in um in the fifth precinct and it's the same neighborhood i live in and um doing small things that that help people um i think is a good thing all right thank you so much i am not oh sorry i realize that we need a second for this formality wise Second. second. All right. It's been moved and seconded, and I would, I'm not seeing any other discussion, so the clerk, please call the roll. Councilmember Payne. Aye. Wamsley. Aye. Rainville. Aye. Vita. Aye. Ellison. Aye. Osman. Aye. Goodman. Aye. President Jenkins. Aye. Chavez. Aye. Chugtai. Aye. Johnson. Aye. Vice President Palmasano. Aye. Chair Koski. Aye. There are 13 ayes. That motion carries. We are now to our next amendment, which is from Councilmember Rainville and Councilmember Osman. Councilmember Osman, please introduce your amendment. <laughs> or if you're, Councilmember Rainville is going to. Well, you're good with this? Okay. <laughs> so th this is uh, an amendment that I've worked with Councilmember Osman on. Uh, opioid addiction is an absolute problem in uh, not only in his area, but there are our members uh, 
of, of who worship in the third ward who it affects. And I'm very supportive of this. I'd ask my colleagues to help uh, shine a, a deeper light on this issue in our city. And please vote for this today. Thank you. Thank you. Councilor Osmond, did you want to say anything? Uh, yes. Uh, many times here I say my community was dealing uh, with a uh, pandemic before the pandemic. Uh, this is a crisis uh, daily. There's overdoses daily in, um, in Native American and East African community in my district. And uh, as a city, we have uh, obligation to really save human life. And that is providing information, education, awareness. And um, city of Minneapolis, um, really never allocated, speaking uh, specifically opioid epidemic, we have allocate staff, uh, full-time staff, but not actual programming. Um, with the opioid settlement, uh, we're just uh, taking some money of that and focusing on uh, very un, un, uh, there's underserved low-income uh, hot-hit areas in the city of Minneapolis. So uh, I thank my uh, colleague Rainville for bringing this up and my uh, colleagues for their support. Thank you. Thank you. I see we have Councilmember Payne in queue, but I also skipped the second dean, I think, on this. So Second. <laughs> All right. Uh, Councilmember Payne. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, yeah, I just wanted to uplift this uh, and say, you know, earlier this year, I authored a legislative directive to explore medication assisted therapy, but it's really good to follow up those types of actions with real investments into this work because we know the scale of this crisis. We could probably increase this amount by an order of magnitude and still not meet the need, but I'm glad that we are allocating budget to this really important work. Thank you. Uh, we have uh, moved this and it's seconded. I'm not seeing any further discussion, so I'll ask the clerk to call the roll. Emily. Oh, I'm sorry, <laughs> Councilmember Vita. Thank Apologies. you, sorry. I couldn't get in the queue quick enough. I just wanted to thank um, Council Members Osman and Rainville for working on this together. You know, at our last public hearing on the budget, we had folks come in and speak to this very issue. And I'm, I'm, happy that you all reacted in this way because the need is clearly there and you've listened to the people. So thank you both for working on this together and I'm so happy to support this. Yeah. All right, now I will have the clerk call the roll. Council Member Payne. Aye. Wamsley. Aye. Rainville. Aye. Vita. Aye. Ellison. Aye. Osmond. Aye. Goodman. Aye. President Jenkins. Aye. Chavez. Aye. Chugtai. Aye. Johnson. Aye. Vice President Palmasano. Aye. Chair Kosky. Aye. There are 13 ayes. That motion carries. And we are now to our next amendment. It is from Council Member Chavez, number 23. But it might be my understanding that you are pulling this amendment. Would you like to speak to this? Yes, thank you, Budget Chair uh, Kosky. I'll be dropping this amendment, so I won't move this forward. I've been working with the Regular Services Department to move current ARPA funds to use right now to expand our current needle pickup services um, and it'll help it for 2023 and possibly 2024 and we'll also be working on the legislative directive together with reg services and the health department on our current needle pickup services and contracts and hope for its expansion for the years to come and i know that i can probably speak for councilman osman but in ward six and ward nine we have a lot of needle litter on the ground where a lot of the children we represent aren't able to go play outside. So I think exploring this option is something that's gonna be really critical to the safety of our residents. So all that is to say is that I'm dropping this amendment. All right, thank you. We will move on to our next amendment, number 24. This is from Council Member Goodman and the Council Vice President. Council Member Goodman, please introduce your amendment. Um, thank you, Madam Chair and 
Council Member Palmisano, who's been so helpful, and particularly your staff, who has just been great in doing a bunch of research on this. This is an amendment to uh, reduce a position one time in the communications office and allocate $134,216 to the 27 neighborhoods that have fallen below the $20,000 mark. Um, based on feedback from neighborhoods in my ward, the city, between its auditing function, its board development function, and its uh, accounting functions, kind of tells them they have to spend 5,000 of the 10,000 they're getting in a very specific way, which leaves no money to do basically anything else. Um, this council did vote, not unanimously, to have a base funding amount of 25,000 that was not incorporated into Neighborhoods 2020. Um, this would give us one year to figure out how we can make sure that we are going to um, fund the things we're asking them to do. And I will just share, and maybe I shouldn't, but I had a great conversation with Councilmember Payne about some ideas he had for ways that we could work with neighborhoods to um, reimburse them for the work that we're asking them to do. And that is what the second portion of the legislative um, direction comes from to take a look at how we've been doing things and new ways of doing things so that we can ensure that when we have these neighborhoods and we're asking them to do things for us, that we actually give them the resources to do it. I don't think we can ask them to review variances, communicate about sewer projects, submit um, traffic calming requests, work on diversity on their boards, figure out how to include renters, have ice cream socials, and then give them $10,000 to do all that work. It just does not make sense to me. We saw during the pandemic, neighborhoods were the hub of comfort and care for many neighborhood residents. And so we pride ourselves on having a strong neighborhood network. This would help tide those that would not be able to be tided over. Over It involves 27 neighborhoods. I have a list in my office prepared by Councilmember Palmisano's office. Um, so I hope everyone will see fit to promote, to support this one-time funding. And then I know Councilmember Palmisano and others will speak to the staff direction. I would like to be added as an author to that, if that's okay. Um, I really love the collaboration of this work. I also want to say that of all the members of the council, Councilmember Johnson has been the most consistent along with me, supporter of neighborhoods. And he has carried a lot of water for a long period of time. And he has some great neighborhoods that care a lot about neighborhood organizations. And I just give props to him for um, urging me and Councilmember Palmisano and others to think about how to do this differently. I wasn't sure that anyone would agree with the two of us. And now I'm finding that actually there's a lot of agreement we need to do something. Uh, this is the something we've come up with for the budget process. I'll also note I almost never have budget amendments, so it's very unusual for me to even have a budget amendment. I would appreciate your support and, again, want to thank Councilmember Palmisano for doing much of the work involved in this as well. Thank you. Thank you, Councilmember Goodman. Uh, and do I have a second for this? Second. Thank you. It's been moved and seconded, and I see we have Councilmember Rainville in queue. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Just a sh short note of thanks to Councilmember Goodman, Councilmember Palmisano, and of course, Councilmember Johnson. You have been an avid supporter all your tenure in the neighborhoods. And my neighborhood groups have come to me, and they're, they're troubled, and they're feeling stressed. And this is a, a kind of a Band-Aid, but at least we're putting a Band-Aid on the wound and uh, limping into <laughs> next year. So thanks to the three uh, uh, experienced leaders on the council. Thank you. Um, let's see here. Any, oh, I see Councilmember Chugtai. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I guess I'm just wondering if perhaps it's the authors, perhaps it's, um, directors, Bergstrom and, uh, Mo that, that might want to like add so, just a little clarity, but the thing I'm wondering is why the decision to pull this, um, why the funding is coming from the communications department and, and FTE in that department when I just, you know, I'm just thinking about the after action review that has been, that we've, you know, has been discussed in the community and the news, but we've also all um, 
talked about it in committee a few different times, and one of the things that really has stood out to me about the after action review is this need for uh, this greater need from the city to communicate in a more regular and rapid and accurate manner that is accessible, particularly to our underrepresented communities. And in this most recent update, I remember Director Bergstrom presenting something on, um, uh, you know, plans to do that type of, of communication. And I worry that taking away an FTE who might do a lot of that implementation might get in the way of us, you know, following through on some of that after action review planning we've been talking about. So that's, I'm, I'm, I'm wondering about the source um, and Anyone who wants to speak to it, great. Um, Madam Chair, is that okay? Councilmember Chug Tai, um, neighborhood organizations' main purpose is to communicate with residents. So it makes sense that they are going to take on, as they have, a lot of communication type work. This is an interagency coordinator position that currently does not exist in communications. So it's not cutting communications. It's saying we trust neighborhoods to be working with us on communications. It's also one-time funding, so within the biennial budget, they would be funded for the interagency coordinator position in 2024. That's that's really really helpful. I, you know, I don't disagree that neighborhood organizations are a part of how we the they're kind of the the they can at times be a conduit of communication between the city and residents. But when I see that nearly half of these dollars are going to go. A, to Ward 3, 7, 11, and 13, I have a, a difficult time understanding how it's helping us expand or you know expand some of that communication with the right group of people, communication with the most impacted people problem, right? And I just I remember the the conversation in committee around this, in budget committee when this was originally presented and Councilmember Johnson said this thing about you know increasing money uh, uh, for neighborhood organizations isn't a bad thing, right? When we do it, in a, when we say ten thousand isn't enough, maybe we're taking you know all of this money and splitting it up equally among all the organizations. That I think at least still. Yeah, I will. I'll actually. I'll stop here. I'm sorry. Okay. I would also maybe ask someone from communications, or I see Ms. Lindsay is here, so can maybe also clarify as well. Thank you. Um, thank you, Chair Koski and council members, and I would uh, appreciate the opportunity to talk a little bit about the impact on communications that this um, deferment of one year of funding would have on our department. Um, but first, I would like to say that we fully support uh, neighborhood organizations having increased funding and all of work that they do um, for the residents in communications and the other areas. Um, we are certainly uh, supportive of that. Um, but this one-time funding would require the communications department, as it has been laid out, to defer the hiring of an interagency coordinator position for one year, so we won't be able to hire the position until 2024. Um, our department has not seen an increase in positions uh, for several years now, and so this actually will make us be uh, one FTE smaller next year versus maintaining at a level because some of our positions are moving to the Office of Community Safety. Um, what I do want to talk about is our cultural radio program. This program has expanded um, greatly since 2016 when it was a pilot. It's something we're very proud of. Um, the last two years, we've actually gone from the one program in 2016 to doing uh, programs in four different languages. And this year we'll be expanding to five different languages, including our first Romo program um, this month in December. So we did 103 programs in 2021 and we'll be doing 109 programs this year. And that is without dedicated staff support. So all of the money we receive goes straight into community and into our community media vendors. So we have been doing this in partnership with Neighborhood and Community Relations um, with uh, pieces of time from different staff members who are also focused on media relations, um, social media, and other things. And so our interagency coordinator was not only going to work on making sure we were NIMS compliant, looking at processes and procedures, making sure that we had better analytics and metrics tracking, so not only were we serving departments better, but ultimately serving the residents better, but they were also going to have a portion of their time 
dedicated to being the project manager for this growing body of work. So we truly had an individual dedicated to this very important work versus having pieces of somebody's time really reaching out to our cultural communities. And we won't be able to do this without this position starting next year. And we are at risk at not only sustaining the programs that we're doing, but the new programs that we were taking on. And so I did want to share that information today, and I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you so much. I see we have President Jenkins in queue. Would you like to still speak? Yeah, thank you, um, Madam Chair. And it's not necessarily for you, um, Ms. Lindsay. Um, you know, I, I, I'm going to support this motion today, but I, I just want to speak about how we got here and, and how we're going to move forward. Um, you know, we really did a reset on the Neighborhood uh, 2020 plan to address the inequities that the NRP program has had over time and uh, since its inception, really. And... Um, you know, I, I, I get the sense that every year we're going to continuously come back and say, well, what about this neighborhood? They, they really can't do the work with just this amount of funding. Um, and we built in other opportunities for neighborhoods to access more funding. I, I've, I've been hearing from neighborhood organizations that, you know, we rely on our, our executive director to do all of the work and we don't have um, distressed organizations in our communities that can, that we can partner with to do um, that kind of work that we're asking people to do to address some of these equity concerns. And so I, I, I'm just concerned that, you know, we, we talk about equity, and, but, but what we do is equality. And equality continues to make those communities that have been under-resourced in the past continuously under-resourced. So I just want to make that statement. Thank you. So we have the amendment before us. I just want to be clear that we were going to be voting on uh, this amendment, number 24, and then we have a legislative directive next uh, so that everybody, I just want to make sure that there's some clarity here. So we have the amendment before us, and I will ask the clerk to call the roll. Council Member Payne. Aye. Wamsley. Aye. Rainville. Aye. Vita. Aye. Ellison. Aye. Osman. Aye. Goodman. Aye. President Jenkins. <clears throat> Aye. Chavez. Aye. Chugtai. Aye. Johnson. Aye. Vice President Palmer. <coughs> Aye. Chair Kosky. Aye. There are 13 ayes. That motion carries, and we are now next to next in line is the legislative directive. This is from Council Vice President, Council Member Payne, Council Member Johnson, mm -hmm. Council Member Wansley, and Council Member Goodman. Uh, Council Vice President, would you please just introduce this and we can take the call, the roll. Thank you, Madam Chair. This is the second part of this. Um, we have considered, to, to the Council President's point, we have considered stopgap funding for neighborhood groups three years in a row now, and this is not the way we should be doing business. Um, neighborhood groups every year are left with a really uncertain future and they feel like they're unable to make plans, so they hold on to their old NRP funds in reserve because they're not sure year to year if they're going to be able to continue operating and what level. Um, you know, I, I think we all agree that neighborhood groups provide a vital connection between the city and our residents. We rely on them to do a lot of engagement work and communication, like Council Member Goodman mentioned. Um, you know, we, we rely on them to do communications for things we don't have the infrastructure to do ourselves. For example, Public Works relies on the organizational abilities for neighborhood groups to assist with outreach and communications on street projects. Um, 
we think they have an incredibly high return on investment. Um, you know, just the last couple of years, they leveraged almost 225,000 volunteer hours. Um, and this is all work that benefits our city. So this legislative directive asked the mayor to look at the Neighborhoods 2020 program to evaluate the base funding options an appropriate amount on an ongoing basis for neighborhood groups to evaluate the effectiveness of other funding mechanisms in the program. And it asks to also analyze the NRP outstanding issues, right? How do we best support neighborhood organizations to spend the $26 million of funds remaining in the program in a timely way? What is the appropriate amount of NRP funds for a neighborhood organization to hold in reserve? And how can we evolve those original um, state, you know, uh, uh, agreed upon things to, to meet modern needs, whether that's, um, whether that's rental assistance, whether that's green energy kinds of things. Um, are there, is there an ability here to update what those funds can be used on in the future? Um, I think this will help us get out of this cycle that we're in and identify options to really achieve sustained funding for neighborhood groups. Um, and I think that we know that a citywide network of neighborhood groups is, is what's essential to help on our outreach, both from, from the ground up into the city and the city back to residents. So um, I will move this legislative directive as part of this and um, appreciate my appreciation to Council Members Johnson, Payne, Wansley, and Goodman who have helped us to get to this point and make this better. Second. Thank you. All right, this has been moved and seconded. I am not seeing any additional discussion from my uh, colleagues, so I'll ask the clerk to call the roll. Council Member Payne. Aye. Wansley. Aye. Rainville. Aye. Vita. Aye. Ellison. Aye. Osman. Aye. Goodman. Aye. President Jenkins. Aye. Chavez. Aye. Chugtai. Aye. Johnson. Aye. Vice President Palmasano. Aye. Chair Kosky. Aye. There are 13 ayes. That motion carries. And we are moving on to our next amendment. It is from Councilmember Chavez. <clears throat> Before we go on to this, I just want to do a time check here. We have, let's see here, one, two, three, four, five more amendments to get through. We may do this. I know that uh, Chair Johnson for Public Works has offered to potentially move this that back a little bit so that we can squeeze this in, but I just wanna make sure that we are still uh, mindful of time, and if we can do this these next few in the next half hour, that would be ideal. So, uh, let's see. Not to stop any discussion, I'm just moving us, <laughs> moving us along here. All right, so, Councilor Chavez, I know that you might have a revision for, yes. uh, for this, so yes. please budget, go ahead. Budget Chair Kosky, thank you very much, and thank you for keeping us along. After a conversation with the health department and hearing their concerns, I'll be making an amendment on a different funding source. So it will now be to the Office of Neighborhood Safety General Fund for this instead of the health department. So you will not see a paper amendment in front of you because I expect you to take this vote tomorrow instead of today. So I'll just be making a verbal amendment uh, um, if the clerk can help me out. But basically changing the funding source from the health department to the Office of Neighborhood Safety. Okay, I got it. Uh, so this will fund one to two summer activities in underserved communities. You remember that during the distribution of the $1 million in ARPA funds, there was communities that were not included in the final funding uh, that this amendment hopes to achieve. And those are the Latinx and East African communities. So it will help us, it will help focus on helping children and young people re-engage, recover and accelerate learning and the development of severe disruptions caused by the pandemic. All right. I'll just ask for the support. Okay. All right. Thank you, Councilmember Chavez. Is there a second to this motion? Second. We have uh, this amendment has been moved and seconded. Are there any questions? I am not seeing any questions. Oh, sorry, Council President Jenkins. Thank you, um, Chair Kosky. Um, Councilmember Chavez, can you? Um, Explain again, I'm sorry, I didn't quite understand. You said yes. these communities were left out of what? 
that I miss. Okay, let me rephrase that into a, a better process. Uh, during the ARPA process, the mayor and city council approved one million dollars to the youth coordinating board to conduct activities where they were able to issue RFPs to different community groups. If you remember in the conversation with the youth coordinating board, there was some communities that either one didn't apply to the funding stream or didn't receive funding because of a lack of applications or a lack of funding, to be honest. There just isn't enough funding going to these programs. So my amendment adds $50,000 to that that would be administered by the youth coordinating board and they would be able to administer one to two different programs. And my goal with adding underserved communities is that the Latinx community and the East African community were not reflective in that budget process of $1 million. So is it that they didn't apply or they were denied? From my understanding in the Youth Coordinate Board, at least in the Latinx community, one per, one, well, there was one application, but there's not enough funding sources for this. But if the Health Department, Commissioner Richie, yeah, don't want me to put you in the spot. If you have more information on that, that might be helpful for folks on the dais. I see Commissioner Richie is on her way up. Thank you, Chair Kosky, Council Member Chavez, members of the council. I don't have a lot of information on the YCB RFP. I do know that there was far more applicants than there were funding for that ARPA money. So that's pretty much all I can tell you about those, those funds. Thank you. Yeah. Any further questions? No, thank you. That's, okay. Thank you, Madam Chair. All right, I'm not seeing any additional questions or discussion. Uh, we have the amendment before us, and I will ask the clerk to call the roll. Council Member Payne. Aye. Wansley. Aye. Rainville. Aye. Vito. Aye. Ellison. Aye. Osman. Aye. Goodman. Aye. President Jenkins. Aye. Chavez. Aye. Chugtai. Aye. Johnson. Aye. Vice President Palmasano. Aye. Chair Kosky. Aye. There are 13 ayes. That motion carries. Our next amendment is from Councilmember Rainville and Councilmember Osman. And Councilmember Rainville, will you please introduce the amendment? Yes, thank you. Uh, and I, first of all, I want to uh, thank Councilmember Osman and his staff, as well as my staff, for working on this. Councilmember Osman, you, you've been very helpful in uh, teaching me about the needs uh, that this will address. And uh, many communities do not have access to women's sexual health and education services. I've heard from my East African residents in Ward 3 on this issue and as an example of a community that will benefit from this funding uh, that is currently lacking. This will bring the, the services to as many women who deserve and need them. And so again, I, I thank you, Councilman Rosman, for helping me with this. Thank you, Councilman Rainville. Councilman Rosman, did you want to speak to this as well? Um, and no, thank you, uh, thank you, Councilman Rainville, for your leadership. Uh, it's uh, a wonderful amendment for uh, culturally specific uh, women's health, and I uh, appreciate your help drafting that. Thank you. Uh, for formality, I'll ask that there's a second. All right, this has been moved and seconded. I see we have Councilmember Jenkins in queue. Thank you, uh, Madam Chair. I, I would just state that um, I serve on the advisory committee for a group called Isharun, uh which has been uh, conducting, we conducted a survey of um, women's health needs in um, primarily in the East African community. Um, we know that there has been a number of um, sexual health issues in that community as well as barriers to um, language barriers, cultural barriers for seeking um, accessible health care. So um, I'm supportive of this uh, budget amendment today. Thank you. I see Councilmember Chugtai is also in queue. I'll keep this brief. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, I, only stating this now because I have now heard about it from six different people who have reached out. Um, I have had a chance to talk with both the authors of this and understand really clearly that 
this money is not going to go to the intention of this money is to not end up in the hands of someone who's going to go into into mosques or cultural centers and tell our our youth that abortion is bad like just it is about like full spectrum health um education thank you i am not seeing any further discussion so i will ask the clerk to call the roll council member payne Aye. Wamsley. Aye. Rainville. Aye. Vita. Aye. Ellison. Sorry, I did that was <laughs> uh, sorry. I couldn't hear too many too many things. Uh, aye. Okay. Osman. Aye. Goodman. Aye. <laughs> President Jenkins. Aye. Chavez. Aye. Chugtai. Aye. Johnson. Aye. Vice President Palmasano. Aye. Chair Koski. Aye. There are 13 ayes. That motion carries. And we are now on to amendment number 28. This is from Councilmember Payne and Councilmember Osman. I know that there is a revised version that you guys should all have received. Uh, and so I would like to ask that Councilmember Payne introduce the motion. Thank you, Madam Chair. Yes, this is um, taking $186,000 out of regulatory services, $27 million budget and investing in our co-enforcement model uh, of enforcement in civil rights. And so uh, this one was a really hard one to source. Uh, you know, this is a very tight budget. No department wants to be cut, especially in these times. We've been through so much. Um, but I do want to acknowledge we've made some significant investments in the programs and reg services. We're making very significant investments in the safety of the workers in reg services, um, including body-worn cameras. And we're even doing, at the, at the legislative level, advocating for changes to the state statute, additionally for worker protections for reg services. And I recognize how important that is and how much we are asking of the reg services department. So this, I weighed this decision very heavily and I landed on this as the source because I wish every employee in Minneapolis had the level of care and consideration that the city of Minneapolis has for its workers. Uh, frontline workers have been through so much over these last couple of years, and these dollars are gonna go towards, still our enforcement goals around our, our ordinances, our enforcement of worker protections, our enforcement to make sure that uh, people have safe uh, and sick time, make sure that they're getting fully paged and they're not experiencing wage theft. Uh, this is only the tip of the iceberg of the types of worker violations that are out there. And this is not only going to help enforce some of that, but it's also an awareness piece too. This is done in partnership with Setool. They've got really deep relationships with a lot of the most vulnerable workers in our city. And this makes sure workers know their rights, know what's allowed and not allowed. Um, many of these workers are our most marginalized, low-income immigrant workers, um, BIPOC folk. And hopefully, we can get to a point where we can even expand on this. But we've been doing one-time funding year over year since our, some of these worker protections have passed. This is to get a, not only increase the mayor's one-time budget, um, but it's to get to a baseline of continuous and reliable funding for this type of enforcement. So I really do ask for your support, and I'm, I'm grateful to Councilmember Osmond for partnering with me on this. Thank you, Councilmember Payne. And do you mind just uh, clarifying the, the change? I think it's in your change item, but I yes. just want to make sure that everybody understands where and the exact change is. We may need to confirm this with Director Kruver, but um, the mayor had requested one-time funding of 186000 or so. I'm asking to increase that 186000 uh, by an additional basically 186000 this year and then ongoing. So I think the table and the change packet might be incorrect technically. <laughs> okay, I Matt, see the clerk is uh, Madam nodding President, his head. I can, I can express that uh, Councilmember Payne's staff did come to us just before the meeting to say that the language on the front page, which is the amendment we're moving, is correct. correct. Yes. It's simply correcting the materials in the background so that it reflects ongoing funding. Great. Okay, 
just want to make sure everybody understood that. And then as a formality, I'll ask for, for a second for this motion. Second. We have, this has been moved and seconded. And I see we have Council Member Goodman in uh, queue here. Thank you, Madam Chair. I'm wondering if you're not going to ask staff to stand up and say what rental licensing won't be handled or what, I mean, this is an area where the most challenged people in the city need services the most. And so I'm not sure what um, our staff is thinking about this, but we have really beefed up our rental inspections and licensing inspections and renters' rights and animal control. We're already not operating animal control all day long. I just cannot imagine where this is going to come from so you asked other staff to come up. I'm just wondering why this one hadn't been asked. No, we absolutely, Director, please come on up. Ask you and council members. Um, this is always difficult. And oftentimes we're asking to choose, but just to shed some light on the impacts of my department. Although we have $27 million and although 186 seems small, the direct impacts are to our residents. As Council Member, Council Member Goodman has stated, um, the direct impacts will be a reduction to nu du nuisance enforcement citywide, in enforcement in related to our liv livable neighborhoods. This will also touch our growing backlog and longer rental licensing inspection schedules, which impacts our renters' first policies in terms of maintaining healthy and safe homes for 51% of our population, which are renters. In addition, this will reduce our recently hired racially and very diverse um, staff that reflects our community. So, let me put this in perspective so we really understand what we're talking about here. 48% of our nuisance abatements authorizations are in SREB zip codes, which is in Ward 4 and 5. 311 complaints that we respond to in inspection services, MAC, and traffic control, and all of our rental licenses, are again in 33% of the 311 calls are in our SREB zip codes. 67% of our nuisance calls are in wards four and five again. This will impact our inspe in inspection cycle. And again, the backlog that we are addressing and catching up on will be impacted again. So Reg Services likes to work proactively on our work. And some of, again, some of these, this, these dollars will be removed from our alternative enforcement team that we've talked to um, Council Member Vita on that we proactively work with uh, Front Yard Residential uh, in, in terms of really working and supporting our Renters First policies and advocating for our residents. So I, I don't wanna belabor, y'all make the decisions that you will make, but they will have downstream impacts directly to our most marginalized population and impacting the health and safety and livability of our housing stock, as well as the livability on the streets. Do I have any questions? All right, we do have a queue. I am not sure, Director, if they will be directed to you yet, so maybe if you don't mind just sitting close by. Um, I'm sorry, I, I accidentally um, kind of messed the queue up there, so I'm gonna start back uh, to Council President Jenkins, then we'll go to Chugtai, Osman, uh, Chavez, Payne, Ellison. So, uh, Council President Jenkins. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. And, you know, I, a couple of weeks ago on a Saturday morning, I had a meeting at Say Tools offices with a number of immigrant um, community members, and they asked me to do two things pass a strong rent control policy that whatever rent control policy we pass will have to be enforced by regulatory services. They also asked me to please do something about their livability in their apartments. They are living with roach infestations, mice infestations, um, 
running water in their ceilings, all kind of horrific conditions that will require regulatory services to, to be involved in helping us to address. Um, and so I, I, I just can't in good faith, and I was at say tool again, and that was not the issue that they brought up to me was wage step. They, they, they were deeply concerned about the conditions of their uh, living arrangements. And um, while I know wage theft is a significant issue in our city, um, I, I think this budget uh, attempts to address that given all of the constraints that we have. And so um, at this juncture, I'm, I'm unable to support this motion today. All right, thank you. <laughs> Uh, let's see here. I next we have uh, Councilmember Osman. Uh, thank you, Madam uh, Chair, and thanks for Councilmember Payne for really taking the time to think about this. The director came in and said twenty-seven million dollars uh, budget. What we're asking is us people that are serving uh, hotels in downtown Minneapolis, people are serving the food and the restaurants you go to people that have a lot of barriers that cannot advocate themselves, people that called my office last week that uh, complaining the treatment they get, who am I supposed to call? I'm supposed to call the same co-enforcement. This organization is that make their life to help people with barriers. That's who we're supposed to contract. That's who we're supposed to send them to. If I can't refer them, should I, you know, who, who else can I refer them? We have to create a window for, for immigrant community and people that, with the barriers. I understand uh, regulatory services do a wonderful job and I continue supporting regulatory services, uh, but everywhere we touch, the sources, we can't touch it. And this is an issue that's uh, very important to minority communities, immigrant communities, that you are way privileged in the city of Minneapolis than the people we're talking about. So this is a small amount. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, next, we have Councilmember Chavez. Uh, thank you, Budget Chair Koski. I do want to acknowledge that we had folks from Satul in this room a little bit ago. So they were sitting right in front of us and they were here asking for our body to support them in workers' protections, workers' rights, making sure we have this comfort and budget. So I did want to say that folks in Satul, to, to Council President's point, we're here asking our support in this amendment. So this is something that Satul has asked. And this money isn't directly to Satul, but it's for workers' rights. So I, I think that this is something that we need to do. And ultimately, I do agree with my colleague, Councilman Osman, that $27 million is in the department and $186,000 is a small amount. I do have a question for the director. Can you walk us through how you decided to make these specific budget cuts over different programs in your department? I think that there's ways we can find this money through other budget cuts instead of these critical ones that, that, we're, that Reg Services is deciding to make. So I wanna make one clarification. Uh, Chair Koski and Councilmember Chavez, regulatory services does not enforce business licensing. Just wanna make sure. Mm -hmm. um, and when we look at cuts, if I don't do cuts in nuisance abatement, abatement, I'm going into my employees, into my FTEs. So when I look at that, that is how I look at these, these things. I reduce some of the services to maintain some of our FTEs to actually do the work that we are currently committed to doing. I think there are alternative ways to, I agree that we have to address this issue. I don't believe that it should be coming out of my budget in this way. I think there are alternatives to getting to where we need to be. Uh, thank you, Director. I do think it should be coming out of our budget, but that's just my opinion. Pardon? I do think this should be coming out of our budget, but thank no, you. No, it should be coming out of a budget, but I think there are alternative ways to do this, and those are conversations that you can have with the budget office. Again, if we allocate funds, it's gonna be felt somewhere, and unfortunately, 
the same population that we're trying to protect, we're actually impacting them in their homes. So again, tough decisions to make. I defer to the body to make that decision. But again, um, these impacts are felt on both sides of the, the decision. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Next, we have Councilmember Payne. Thank you, Madam Chair. Yeah, I just want to um, let you know some of my thought process here. When I was originally sourcing, I was looking at the expansion of our traffic enforcement, and that would have been a total of two FTEs, and it would have left all of our renter protections in place. But because I saw the importance of the work of Reg Services, I didn't want to prescribe where to cut within the department. I wanted to give the director the maximum amount of discretion in terms of making sure that we were managing that impact in the most thoughtful way possible. And you know, the director would know best about where that allocation would be, be best resourced from. So I want, I want it to be clear that I very intentionally decided to not specify where within reg services to empower our director to make sure that we can minimize that impact as much as possible. Thank you. Uh, next, Councilmember Ellison. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> I, uh, uh, this is definitely a really, I think, painful motion. Uh, in my earlier discussions, I, the, the source being Reg Services was a, uh, a flag for me. Unfortunately, I did not pursue it strongly enough to, to support my colleagues in finding a different source, and I regret that um, at this moment. Uh, and I think that uh, when I'm listening to the director talk, uh, 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 she put it pretty plainly, the people who are most vulnerable to have their wages stolen are the people who live in some of the worst conditions uh, in our city, in our housing stock. And I think that's, that's, what's, that's what's making this uh, particular amendment um, uh, really difficult. There's also a bit of history here in terms of funding out of reg services that I think is... Um, I came in on the on the tail end of, uh, but I and so maybe some of my uh, uh, colleagues who have been here a bit longer can even can illustrate further. Uh, the way that Reg Services used to operate uh, was with uh, one one of your employees said uh, was with a hammer, meaning that they went out and they find people in order to maintain people uh, Reg Service employment. That meant that we couldn't actually approach the work with with the kind of diligence and fairness that, that, that we needed, reg services had to go out and find people to find, right? Uh, and, uh, and, uh, and, and I actually have a, one of my best friends, his mom used to work in reg services way back in the day, and she said, yeah, that's, that's, that's exactly what we would, we would have to go out and do in order to preserve our own employment or to preserve the employment of, of our colleagues. Um, and we have been working really, really hard to, um, to remedy uh, that kind of approach in order to keeping people employed, meaning we, can't, we cannot hire people and keep people uh, because we're finding uh, you know, other people out in the community, you know, overgrowth in the, in, the, in, the, in the alleys and all that kind of stuff. And so um, I am 100% dedicated to addressing wage theft. Uh, I'm wondering if, uh, I know that we don't have much time here left, but I'm wondering if we could um, uh, put this at the bottom of the pile and see if there isn't a way for us to find a different source um, uh, uh, for the reasons that I just illustrated. And if there, and if there are, uh, you know, uh, I'm certainly willing, you know, I know that I got to speak to a motion in, in, in a few minutes here. Um, but, uh, but I'm certainly willing to, to help dive into that. I'm, I'm wondering, I'm hoping staff would be willing to sort of make quick work of that. But I, I really do think that with that history of, reg of how reg services has been funded in the past, with the fact that the changes to that are really, really recent, um, I, th I do think that every dollar is a pain in a way that um, just simply isn't the case for, for, for other departments. So, um, so that would be my ask to see if, if we couldn't take just a few more minutes to see if there isn't another source. Um, and then certainly ongoing is another thing that I'm sort of looking at and saying, that's a real hard decision to make right in this moment. Uh, and so, uh, uh, cause that means that that's funding that's coming out of the department uh, moving forward. So, um, so yeah, so I, I wanted to see, say that and, and, and see if my colleagues would be amenable to uh, taking another, to taking, you know, 
a couple of minutes to find a different source as we worked through these these last two uh, amendments because this isn't something that I want to vote against, um, but not sure that I could vote for it in its current current state. That's all. Thank you, Chair. Okay, thank you. I want to give my colleagues a moment here. I know Councilmember Payne and Councilmember Osmond to consider what Councilmember Ellison has just said. We, we can put it at uh, the bottom of the list and come back. Yeah, I'm, I'm happy actually to revisit this on Tuesday. Uh, and like I said, I, I thought very deeply about this. We had some pretty hard conversations. Um, we I met with the budget director to talk about other sourcing. So like, I felt we had it exhausted our options, but seeing that there is actual interest for this, um, I'd be happy to revisit that. Maybe we could invite Director Kruver up to discuss. Chair Koski and members, um, in, in an effort to help with the expediency we are all experiencing today, the, the one piece of data that I would just put on the table is that in uh, earlier this year, we did ARPA appropriations, and we did appropriate $750,000 to co-enforcement, in addition to the $370,000 that is in the 22 budget and the ongoing $186,000 in next year's budget. That doesn't solve the ongoing question that we are considering, but it may defer the necessity for this to next year. If we don't want to pick it up this year, that of course is up to the body, but that bit of ARPA funding, I just wanted to remind everybody um, what we did earlier this year. Okay, thank you. Uh, so perhaps we could move this to Tuesday and we could maybe have deeper conversations around that. So I am seeing some nodding of heads. I'm wondering if I need to have a motion made for that or if I can, okay, the author can re to move this to Tuesday. So we are going to oh, what, what, retract it and we can move, sorry. All right, let me start over. I believe the author would like to retract this and move this to Tuesday. So we will go ahead and move forward with that. All right, thank you. Next, we have the amendment, which is from Councilmember Wansley. It's number 29. Councilmember Wansley, could you please uh, introduce your amendment? Thank you, Budget Chair Koski. Um, this amendment basically uh, moves 185,000 from MPD to the city attorney's office for a community attorney at the third precinct. Currently, there is only one community attorney split between the first and third precinct. And after speaking with both staff, within MPD and the city attorney's office, it's clear that the demand at the third precinct is incredibly high and more support is needed there. Uh, so shifting these funds from MPD to the office of the city attorney will support the departments in advancing the public safety needs of our residents, um, especially those that reside um, or work within the third precinct uh, borders. So that's the context for that one. Thank you, is there a second? Second. All right, uh, that amendment has been moved and seconded. Are there any questions from my council members? I am not seeing anything, so I will ask the clerk to call the roll. Council member Payne. Aye. Wansley. Aye. Rainville. Aye. Vita. Aye. Ellison. Aye. Osmond. Aye. Goodman. Aye. President Jenkins. Aye. Chavez. Aye. Chugtai. Aye. Johnson. Aye. Vice President Palmasano. Aye. Chair Koski. Aye. There are 13 ayes. That motion carries, and we are on to our final amendment, number 30. Council Member, this is by Council Member Wansley, and I will ask uh, Council Member Wansley to also introduce your amendment. Awesome, and I do want to know um, there's a substitute uh, amendment before you between uh, both I and Council Member Ellison, but Council Member Ellison will speak to that um, after I share some brief comments. Um, so I just want to start off with um, honoring Jerome Stewart, Nadifa Muhammad, Marion Muhammad Mohamud, Amatala Adam, Tyler Scott Barron. These are the names of the five public housing residents who died from smoke inhalation in 2019 when the Cedar High Tower caught on fire. Without a fire suppression system, these residents were completely vulnerable and their deaths were preventable. 
publicly owned and operated housing should have basic safety systems. And I hope that is not controversial. Since 2019, there has been a strong multi-jurisdictional work um, done by multiple elected leaders to get needed funding to install uh, fire suppression systems in all 42 towers owned by the Minneapolis Public Housing Authority. But right now there are four towers with a total of 120 units that are still unprotected. So that's why uh, now Council Member I and, um, well, Council Member Ellison and I are moving to uh, have $1.2 million be used to close the gap and making sure that all of our residents in those four remaining towers are protected. Um, the funding for this is being redirected from a program within the Affordable Housing uh, Trust. And I do want to acknowledge that the uh, Affordable Housing Trust is a value, valuable part of supporting the continuum of affordable housing because it provides grants to develop a range of housing. Um, some of that housing is considered affordable at 30% AMI. Some of it is mixed use, which can include market rate housing. Um, these funds can also go towards public, nonprofit, or private developers. And all of this housing is vitally important, but I do want to highlight that public housing is the single gold standard when it comes to affordable uh, affordability. Uh, for a family of four, for example, 30% of AMI is about $35,200. Uh, and when we look at the residents who live in the four MPHA towers without fire suppression systems, only 22% have earned income at all. The average annual income for these residents is just under $16,000, meaning public housing is the only place that residents can be guaranteed to pay 30% of their income and in rent regardless of the area uh, median um, income. So as we work on developing a well-funded system to support all levels of affordable housing, and I want to thank, uh, you know, uh, Executive Director uh, Abdi Wasame, uh, also Representative Noor, and also uh, the Taxation Chair, uh, Representative Fuli, for sharing uh, their desire to work in tangent with all of us in, in making that long-term fu uh, funding happen. But I do want to note, you know, we have to make sure that public housing residents don't get left behind in that process. This is a racial justice issue. Over 60% of residents in these four towers are black or African American. Over 60% are elderly and over 60% are disabled. And I'm not okay with leaving those residents vulnerable to potential fatal uh, fires. So all that said, the city council has the opportunity today to put the final piece in the puzzle and ensure that no public housing resident has to go through the loss of life nor the, the trauma that a fire can trigger. I have worked, again, very closely with our staff now, MPHA, um, to hopefully get to a place where we can support this amendment. Um, and I will ask for my colleagues' support in this. Thank you, Councilmember Wansley. Is there a second to this motion? Uh, second, and then if I could. Uh... And Councilmember Ellison, please feel free to speak to this too. Thank you. Uh, first, I want to thank Councilmember Wansley for bringing this forward. I know that uh, it was another one of those amendments that was initially very, very painful for me uh, because the Affordable Housing Trust Fund is typically not an ideal source for for anything because it, it goes to our it goes to build uh, our affordable city, um, but. Uh, Councilmember Wansley is right that, um, and I'm glad that she was able to name the people who who uh, who perished in the fire not too long ago, and uh, and we've got to have protection for residents. We we have to um, uh, be a part of uh, solving some of MPHA's infrastructure problems, and I know that we have been. Staff has been, and the city has been. Um, but we're presented with an opportunity to to fill the gap, as Councilmember said. Um, uh, but there were a few things that I, I still had a problem with when it came to the source. And, and one was that the Affordable Housing Trust Fund is one of the, the few sources that we have to build new units. And I, and I wanted to make sure that we did not um, undercut our ability to continue to build new units, which I also know is not at all uh, uh, Council Member Wansley's intention. And so uh, the, some of the changes that we were, we've made here is for the allocation to still come within the Affordable Housing Trust Fund, but uh, using uh, CBDG dollars, uh, which can't be used for new construction. Um, and correct me if I get any factual er if I have any factual errors here. Um, and also to ensure that the money is spent um, uh, within uh, 
Within 2023, we've added a provision that the dollars be spent by September 1st. Um, that way, uh, if, if they're not, or if other funding sources emerge from the state or elsewhere, uh, we can still leverage CBDG dollars um, uh, 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 and get those out the door for other projects. And so uh, that is, I think, a win-win. We leave no doubt about whether or not um, the fire suppression systems uh, will can be funded and will be funded, uh, but still leave ourselves enough room um, to reallocate this money elsewhere um, if, uh, if, if that opportunity arises. Uh, and so again, thank you to uh, Council Member Wansley for uh, working with me and, 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 and helping to get myself to a yes on this, on this critical issue um, and for being amenable to the changes that, uh, that you see here in the substitute motion. Thank you, Councilmember Ellison. We have a few more council members in queue. We have Councilmember Payne. Thank you, Madam Chair. Yeah, this, this, uh, I had early conversations with Councilmember Wansley on this, and I had originally had a lot of um, concerns about even touching the Affordable Housing Trust Fund. And I kind of fell into, I would say, one of my crutches, which is to start thinking like an engineer. And I started to try to think about how the Affordable Housing Trust Fund has this kind of multiplier effect. It's not about the, to the, the dollars that are invested into housing, it's about the dollars that unlocks the number of investments that private developers can make. And it, it should, you know, that $9 million of the, the total fund is, should translate, and you know, Director Brennan would be able to give me a very specific ratio. And I started going to that engineer brain of what's the ratio of leverage that, you know, every dollar got, that goes into the Affordable Housing Trust Fund is some multiplication number greater than that dollar. And I started getting into this kind of like overly calculating brain of, you know, every dollar that we touch in that fund is gonna translate into a reduction in total number of units that are ultimately built. But what you ultimately end up with that line of thought is putting some sort of moral value on the human life of the people who live in, in the building. And this originally, this amendment originally started as, you know, kind of like a broad number of investments to chip away at um, the overall backlog of, of improvements that are necessary for our housing stock and our public housing. And what Council Member Wansley did through some of those conversations is really narrowed this down to fire suppression systems rather than generally chipping away at, at, at that backlog, which we still need to do, and I think we still need to have a deeper conversation about a public housing uh, levy. And I think that is actually the appropriate mechanism to start addressing some of that backlog. But you can't math your way into thinking it's okay to have our most marginalized community living at the risk of dying by fire. And the fact that Councilmember Wansley started this with I mean, there are lives that are impacted through this and the lives that have been impacted by uh, you know, a, system, a systemic disinvestment in, in, in this housing. And the most affordable housing that we have is the housing that we have already built. And so it's just, you, you can't compare the total units that may theoretically have been constructed with these dollars in the Affordable Housing Trust Fund with the terror of the thought of an, uh, another life, life loss that could have been prevented through um, a difficult, but I think necessary choice. So I'll be supporting this amendment. Thank you. Uh, next, we have Councilmember Goodman. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, the original proposal I would never have been able to support. And this proposal is marginally better and I guess I will kind of share with you why I think that for what it's worth. Um, leverage is one of the most important things that we do as a city when providing funding for affordable housing. We are not a primary affordable housing funder. We partner with debt sources and other equity sources. We put our money in to leverage other money. This contribution does not leverage another penny. Hopefully, since we're getting emails from legislators, they will see this as an effort to get them to contribute to put in more money. I will note so far, the city has put in more money than the state or the federal government into the fire suppression systems. So to be lobbied by the state who has put in less than the city and they're like 50 times the size, 
probably says something about the backlog of the political problem at the Capitol that could be broken through during this session. Um, I will note that there is unspent money in public housing accounts right now for fire suppression systems. And so they have not been able to spend all the money that they've been given. So I don't know that they will be able to spend this money and this money will not be anywhere near enough to actually even do one building. There'd have to be more leverage in order to do that. Uh, we have also contributed $3.7 million in this budget to public housing. Any of that money could have been earmarked for fire suppression systems, but was not. Probably this is the biggest concern, so perhaps that was the choice that was made. But nonetheless, we put $3.7 million in, and Councilmember Warsame is welcome to use that $3.7 plus this money to get an entire building done if he so chose to do that. Um, but it doesn't sound like he is willing to do that. Um, we've been strategic in the past, and I think it's important for us to continue to be strategic, otherwise we will be holding the bag of the federal government's lack of investment in public housing. And that is the biggest problem of all, in my opinion. Ultimately, the Affordable Housing Trust Fund is the largest source in the state from a municipality going into the construction and preservation of affordable housing. And although the CDBG money cannot be used to build new units, it is very strategically used to preserve existing units. I'll just point out the Park Plaza project that we just funded in our Affordable Housing Trust Fund awards this week is a building that is 100%, 30% area median income and is in dire need of preservation and the trust fund is funding that. And usually the trust fund funds uh, maybe like 20% uh, of all the projects are preservation projects, so one preservation project probably won't happen as a result of this. Lastly, I will say no affordable housing trust fund money goes to market rate units. That is just simply false. And I wanna make sure it is clear uh, that these projects are at 60, 50, and 30% of area <coughs> median income. We just funded almost 1,400 new units, one-third of them at 30% of area median income. And the biggest problem there is not the lack of capital, but the lack of service and support funding. We just saw what happened over at Better Futures, where a whole bunch of people showed up at our meeting because they were evicted, and there's problems with service provision in these buildings. It's not a capital problem, it's a service provision problem. So I do think that this is better than the original um, motion. Uh, but I want to note that losing anything out of the trust fund will impact the number of units that we will be able to preserve or build in the next year. And we are highly successful at adding units at this area of income. We have you know, many staff who spend all year long working on this. If you were on biz, you would have met them on uh, just this week alone. It's a big celebration of the work that's been done and I do think that um, taking money from this fund is uh, generally a mistake, but if we're putting money in and it can leverage state money, great. And according to this motion, if not, the money will go back into the trust fund because there we had $37 million worth of requests and we were able to fund 14 and a half million. Thank you. Uh, next, we have Councilmember Osman. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I think I have about 12 dozen of, uh, I guess, 12 or over MPHA high-rise buildings that are built, I don't know, 70 years ago, 80 years ago, that are in not a one good condition. Uh, and we remember, we all remember what happened on Cedar Riverside. The residents that live here are way different than affordable housing trust fund residents. These residents here are seniors, disabled, uh, most of them zero income, they don't work. And um, each building is close to 12, uh, 200 units. So it's no brainer that we should keep uh, this resident safe. We don't want another disaster taking place. I have talked to uh, director or some many times about an advocated on, on cons, uh, congresswomen and uh, state legislative and so on to make sure that we're getting this fire um, uh, safety taken care of. Um, 
president are concerned. And um, as much as I don't like the affordable housing trust fund sources, uh, this is one step away of saving a next human life. And um, they're much needed, much needed work that needs to be done. I encourage all of you to visit and come and look at what kind of conditions are these buildings are at the moment. Thank you. Thank you. Next, we have Council President Jenkins. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. And I am really glad that we have um, shifted this fund to, I was deeply concerned about um, the source. I, I would argue that this does fit the criteria of preservation, preservation. Um, and so my biggest concern, and I, and I expressed this earlier, um, is that we are on a very slippery slope. And if we continue to take up the responsibilities of other forms of government, they are gonna just continue to let us do that. And we have a very limited source of funds at the city of Minneapolis, unlike the state of Minnesota that collects taxes from the entire state, much of which comes from Minneapolis, I might add, and nor do we have the capacity of the federal government to actually print money. So, you know, as long as we keep saying we're going to do all the work that the county does, that the state does, that the federal government does, they're going to continue to say, do it, Minneapolis. Thank you. Thank you. Next, we have Councilmember Chavez. Uh, thank you, Budget Chair Koski. I was originally a no on this amendment based on my protection of the Affordable Housing Trust Fund and meetings that I had, but I just want to thank Councilmember Wansley and Councilmember Ellison for making these changes, being accommodated and hearing the concerns of many of us up here, and want to say that I am more than happy to support it now. Thank you. Um, you know, with in light of some of the changes, I would like to ask if Director Brennan, I see she's here, if you could uh, take a moment to just describe the impacts of this, of the changes that we've been made. Um, Chair Koski, council members, I'm sorry, this is a little emotional. Um, thank you, council member Wansley for uh, naming the names of the lives that we lost. Uh, this, these are really hard decisions that you all have to make. Um, it's my job to share um, what I see as the potential impacts of the decision that's before you. Um, first, I want to say that when MPHA came and, um, and made their budget request to the, the mayor's uh, team, um, I'm there as staff, the budget team was there, we very specifically asked about fire suppression systems and said that that would be our priority in um, the mayor's office said that would be their priority in, in funding this. And MPHA very clearly said, that is not our priority. Our priority is the scattered site rehab. So I just wanna make sure that that's really clear here, that that wasn't um, a request that was made that was not either recommended by staff or not put forward by, um, by the mayor in, in the proposed budget. Um, second, um, uh, as it relates to um, to uh, impacts the um, the 18 million um, that is currently proposed in the Affordable Housing Trust Fund was not an arbitrary number. It was a number that staff calculated and recommended um, based on what we estimate is needed to meet the Metropolitan Council um, goals that we have for new production. And when we factor in that estimate, we factor in that there are always um, the need to preserve existing units. For example, Councilmember Goodman re um, referenced that there's 37 million in requests for affordable housing trust fund and we can only fund um, a portion of that. One of those requests that we can only partially fund was Little Earth, for example. And those are deeply affordable units that have very, very significant um, life and safety issues as well. I mean, these are not easy 
um, decisions to make, and there are not enough funds to go around. Um, the impacts here is that um, there will be about 30 units, fewer units funded um, through the Affordable Housing Trust Fund. 40% um, roughly of those are deeply affordable, uh, serving households with incomes that are below 30% of area median income, and um, the large portion of those are directly targeted to people experiencing um, homelessness. Um, uh, there was a, I, I, Councilmember Payne, I do have the leverage number. On, on, on average, it's about $12 is um, our leverage for every dollar of affordable housing trust fund that's um, invested. That's, um, that changes from year to year, but that is the average from, from last year. Um, the other thing, I, I think I would be remiss um, in, in saying, um, in, unless, if I don't share with you, that there, there are other ways to get both. Um, and um, I, I, I mean, personally, I 100% I agree. It is unacceptable for MPHA high-rise buildings to not have fire suppression systems. I think um, you all, from all of the, um, the, every time we've brought forward funds, we've done it twice now, asking for your support, and you've unanimously approved it, so I know you shared this goal as well. Um, this would be an incredibly uh, competitive application to the state's publicly owned housing program. Um, they have an unprecedented surplus right now, and that is something that um, they could apply for for the remaining four buildings that don't yet have a uh, source that's secured or committed yet. And um, if that doesn't come through at the state, um, like we did the first time that um, my staff brought forward a request to you to fund fire suppression systems, we did that outside of the regular budget process. We found CDBG money, it's a great source. Thank you so much, Councilmember Ellison, for substituting that source. Um, it's the right source for this. We brought forward a request to you outside of the budget process um, to reallocate funds from something that wasn't going to go forward to this. And we very strategically did that in partnership with MPHA, and we said, let's do this together, and then let's go to the state and ask for money. And that is how we got the $2 million from the state through the publicly owned housing program, is that we work together to leverage um, our resources to get um, state dollars two for one. So um, that is also an option that you have before you. If, if this, um, uh, you know, it, it doesn't have to be now. They have seven projects that they are um, starting construction on to put fire suppression systems in um, that will keep them busy for a little while. So if, if, um, if you wanted to wait to see if state funding were an option and it didn't come through, um, we could also uh, identify um, program income that comes in from CDBG or reallocate other CDBG uses or apply to the trust fund because MPHA um, can also apply to the Affordable Housing Trust Fund. In fact, um, the scattered site um, deeply affordable um, expansion project that just closed last week, um, the council, you all appropriated 4.6 million of ARPA funds for that project. Um, they had a gap, so we came in and recommended um, 1.2 million from Affordable Housing Trust Fund contingency to close that gap so that they could close last week and get these 84 deeply affordable um, units uh, uh, underway, and so they closed last week. That's wonderful news. Um, in addition to the city's 5.8 million, the city did um, allocate 20 million of its bonds, um, which then in turn leveraged another 20 million of affordable of um, low-income housing tax credits. So I'm happy to answer any further questions. And um, thank you so much for your support of this incredibly important issue of fire suppression systems. Thank you, Director. I see we have Councilmember Rainville. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. Very briefly, I want to thank uh, Council President Jenkins for your wisdom in explaining how the city is the, almost the funder of last resort, so to speak, for uh, the state and, and federal issues, and that we need the help from those other bodies of government, including uh, the county. And I would remind all of our colleagues, uh, some of us have really deep relationships with federal and state officials, and now's the time to use those relationships to help them fund uh, projects in Minneapolis, not only housing, but the other issues that we need here. So thank you, Council President Jenkins, for your very astute advice. Thank you. I'm not seeing any further discussion or anybody else in queue, so I'm going to ask the clerk to call the roll. Councilmember Payne. Aye. Wamsley. Aye. Rainville. Aye. Vitoff. Aye. 
Ellison. Aye. Osman. Aye. Goodman. Aye. President Jenkins. Aye. Chavez. Aye. Chugtai. Aye. Johnson. Aye. Vice President Palmasano. Aye. Chair Kosky. No. <coughs> there are 12 ayes and one nay. That motion carries. And we have now considered all of our amendments except for one that will be, has been retracted and moved to our Tuesday's meeting. Um, I also just want to make a note for my council members that uh, before that we adjourn, I want to note that uh, I'm in the process of scheduling a regular committee meeting for the budget committee in, committee in January of 2023 so we can make codify the city of Minneapolis's 2023 financial policies. Uh, due to a lack of time during all of our uh, markup meetings because of the high volume of amendments and legislative directives and the increased amount of time needed to consider all amendments and legislative directives this year. Further, as a number of council members will be or would have been absent for the markup meeting tomorrow if we had had it. Uh, the decision was made to schedule an additional regular committee meeting for the budget committee in January of 2023 uh, to codify the city council, to codify the city of Minneapolis's financial policies um, as given the importance of our financial policies. I felt it was necessary for council members to have the opportunity to be briefed on the 2023 financial policies and for us to receive an in-depth presentation on our 2023 financial policies um, in advance of doing this work. If council members have any questions, I'm happy to discuss once we adjourn today. Um, now, uh, we shall move to approve. Adam, the, Madam but we Chair. Should, Oh, go ahead. I think Councilmember Shugtai put herself in queue, so before you close, we might want to just check. Thank you. Councilmember Shugtai. Thank you, Madam Chair. I hope this will be quick. Um, I, without objection from the body, I would just like to um, change uh, my vote on motion number 24 um, from I to nay, which will not change or come close to changing the outcome. Thank you. Thank you. Madam Chair, if there's no objection from the body, I can uh, uh, update that vote. It would become a 12 to one vote. Okay, thank you. So now I will move to approve the 2023 budget as listed on the agenda and as amended by the budget committee. This motion formally forwards the 2023 budget package to the December 6 adjourned city council meeting scheduled for 6.05 p.m. Uh, as you'll see, the budget package includes seven separate resolutions which approve the 2023 city budget and tax levy, the fiscal year 2023 consolidated plan, and the proposed water and sewer rates. If there's a, no objection, I'll move approval of the entire budget package. Uh, would, uh, would any council members like to pull any other resolutions for separate votes? Not seeing any uh, for the discussion, I will ask the clerk to call the roll. Council Member Payne. Aye. Wansley. Aye. Rainville. Aye. Vita. Aye. Ellison. Aye. Osman. Aye. Goodman. Aye. President Jenkins. Aye. Chavez. Aye. Chugtai. Aye. Johnson. Aye. Vice President Palmasano. Aye. Chair Kosky. Aye. There are 13 ayes. That motion carries and the 2023 budget package is referred to the joint adjourned meeting of the city council, council scheduled meeting for December 6 at 6.05. Um, I also would like to ask the clerk to cancel our meeting for tomorrow since we were able to get through all of our business today. Uh, I also want to note that uh, if we could get for, we have the public works and infrastructure committee meeting if we just need to give communications uh, about 15 minutes, and I think Councilor Johnson has something to say about that. <laughs> Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, just so there's a little bit more time for everyone since we've been a long meeting, we will begin uh, no sooner than 2.15. So if council members could try to be back by 2.15 who are on the PWI committee, that way we'll have 22 minutes in between. Great. It, it, um, it, do you, would you like more time? We've got a big agenda, but. All right, we'll, we'll just for you, Council Member Vita and all the other committee members. What's that? Okay. 
We well, we do have a number. Of, I will know we do have a lot of folks in the hallway for this committee. So yeah, we'll uh, we'll go two twenty. <laughs> All right, thank you. All right, we we do thank have you. a. I see we have a compromise there. Uh, <laughs> uh, bef before we adjourn, I just want to say. Oh, we have. Hold on, please sit down. Hold on, Councilmember Ellison. I I just wanted to clarify that uh, I believe it's item 28 uh, still needs to be taken up. Uh, we yes. didn't conclude everything. Oh, I didn't. I did not hear you say that. Yes. Sorry, I just thought yes. I missed. Yes. And so I also just want to say thank you so much to my colleagues. Sorry before you guys leave. I know, but I'm a little emotional here. But um, I just appreciate this is a lot of work to, that we put together and we've shifted billions of dollars to help and support the residents of the city of Minneapolis. And I'm grateful that we did this work together and I'm honored to have been able to do this with each and every one of you today. So thank you. Thank you to our budget director, Amelia Kruver, who has hand held, uh, you know, held our hand through all of this. I want to thank my staff, Melissa Hill and Corinne, and all of our staff members who have worked so hard in this, and then all of our department heads, and then of course our clerks. So thank you so much to everybody. And finally, we are adjourned. So. <laughs>